Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum's Virtual Archaeology Conference on Arnold's Bay. We're so excited to be able to have you all here today, and we've got a great lineup of speakers. I, my name is Catherine Neuva, and I'm the Director of Programs and Visitor Experience here at the museum. We just want to start off with a few Zoom house rules um, to help everyone get acclimated to the space. Um, today we'll be going through five different presentations um, with a small Q&A session at the end of each section. At the final 20 to 25 minutes of the program, we'll be offering a Q&A session um, for any of the topics covered in today's conference. Please feel free to submit all of your questions to the Q&A feature at the very bottom of your screen. You can find it by hovering over the bottom portion of the view. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to use the chat feature um, and that should get us going. So without further ado, I will introduce our executive director of the Maritime Museum, Susan Evans McClure. Susan? Good afternoon. We are in the homeland and unceded territory of the Abenaki people. The Abenaki have been here since time immemorial and continue to be a thriving indigenous culture in our region. We acknowledge with gratitude the generations of stewardship, past, present, and future of all of the indigenous communities who have and continue to call this land home. I'm Susan Evans McClure, and I'm the executive director of Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Welcome to our first ever virtual archeology span conference. Through all of our work, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum is connecting people to the lake, inspiring them to learn from the past, build together in the present, and create a sustainable future. The museum, for those of you who haven't visited us, is located on three acres of waterfront campus just outside of Bergenz, Vermont, on the eastern shores of Lake Champlain. The museum opened in 1985, and today we welcome around 10,000 students and visitors to experience our exhibits, our boat building and rowing programs, and our educational outreach each year. Our team also conducts new archaeological research and stewards our collection of objects, research materials, and archives. The COVID-19 pandemic and the national reckoning on racial justice have given us a chance to really assess what is important to us and what we want to achieve in partnership with our community. And to us, it's all about access. The lake and the history that lies within it belong to the people of Vermont and New York, and we want to make it possible for everyone to experience that for themselves with no barriers to that access. So we no longer charge admission to visit the museum, it's free, and all of our summer camps for kids are on a pay what you can model. We are also taking steps to make our campus and our programs more physically accessible. And we're working to make the lake and the lake's underwater cultural heritage more accessible to everyone. The museum is supported by hundreds of members who make the, provide the financial support for us to be able to offer these programs for free. Many of you joining us today are members already and we thank you for your support. Membership starts at $40 for an individual and $115 for a family, and your membership support makes all of our work possible. We hope you will consider joining as a member today. The link to become a member is uh, shortly will be in the chat, and we'll include it when we send out a recording of today's program. Thank you for making this work possible. We open for the season on May 21st, 2022, so mark your calendars. And until then, we're offering virtual programming like this and our digital museum visit experience on our website where we hope, we hope you will join us as well. Today, our team is thrilled to share some of the latest research methods and new findings in our ongoing work at Arnold, through the Arnold's Bay Research Project. And while the Battle of Valcour Bay and the sinking of ships in what is now Arnold's Bay happened almost 250 years ago, I hope that these presentations will remind us all of how and why this history continues to be relevant today. The things we are learning shed new light on the lived experiences of real people of the past. And while it's called Arnold's Bay, it is certainly not all about Benedict Arnold alone. There were real people on those ships. And our goal is to help the public connect to the past through the stories of individuals. American history is not and was not preordained. History was made by individuals making decisions and taking action. And when people today make that connection, they start to see themselves as empowered history makers who have the ability to make their own decisions that shape the future. And that can start with seeing one object from a real person whose ship sunk in Arnold's Bay. And not only are we learning new things, we're also learning new ways of working, including working in partnership with indigenous communities in ways that be can begin to undo some of the wrongs and omissions that have been perpetuated by the fields of history and archeology. span 
We want all people to see themselves in the past because when they do, they make a stronger commitment to building a healthy future for all of us and for the lake and for our communities. No introduction would be complete without a list of thank yous for all of the people and organizations who make this work possible. This project is funded by a grant from the National Park Services American Battlefield Protection Program. Thank you to ABPP and their team for all of their support. We would also like to thank the Stockbridge Muncie Community Band of the Mohegan Nation and especially Nathan Allison for his support of the project as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Thank you to the Abenaki community for your partnership and support. Thank you also to our partners in the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation. A huge thank you to the Advanced Metal Detecting for the Archaeologists, or AMDA, which is an acronym you will hear a lot of in today's presentation. And special thanks to Joe Balicki, Joel Bohe, Casey Campetti, and Sheldon Skaggs of AMDA. Thank you to Dennis and Vicki Hopper and Annie Hopper and Sean Willerford for providing access to their land on Arnold's Bay. Among the many ways that they made this project possible, Annie and Sean managed the farm fields. They are the owners of Scuttleship Farm, and it was their sheep herd that actually helped to do the initial mowing for the project. And thank you to Ed Skolin, who you will be hearing from today, who has graciously made his time, expertise, and resources available as a volunteer team member on this project. A special thank you to Sherilyn Gilligan, who you'll be hearing from also, who really spearheaded this project from day one. And thanks to our entire research and archeology span team of Cher, Chris Sabic, and Patricia Reed. Thank you also to our team members making today's virtual magic happen, Catherine Noiva, Jack Mersick, and Meg Salax. And thank you all for being here and for learning with us. Now I'll pass things over to Christopher Sabic to get started. Chris? Thank you very much, Susan. I'm very happy to be here with you all today and happy to kick off our first ever uh, virtual archaeology conference on Arnold's Bay. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to start off today with a little background history and discussion of the previous archaeology and work that's been done in Arnold's Bay. Um, and then we will move on to presentations from the other team members that will provide more detail on the actual archaeological work that's been conducted so far. And I would like to start off by suggesting that you keep this, uh, that you, you think of this presentation as kind of a, a check-in on the project. This, is, this project is not completed. This is a project that I would say we're maybe at the halfway point on and that we hope to conduct and discover uh, many new and exciting things in the following uh, field season as well. So uh, God willing, in a year or so, we'll uh, hopefully be presenting another one of these uh, conferences where we can give you some some additional conclusions and information about what we discovered in the summer of 2022. But let me just go ahead and dive right in here to a presentation on the background history and the previous archaeology that has taken place in Arnold's Bay. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, here we go. Um, the Arnold's Bay project, um, you know, is a, we should start off by discussing where Arnold's Bay is exactly, in case you're not familiar with, with the location. Arnold's Bay is a small, shallow bay on the eastern shore of Lake Champlain, located in, uh, uh, that's the Vermont shore, of course, and located in Addison County and in the town of Panton, um, which is just a few miles outside of Virgins and two miles south of where the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum is located. So. You know, for the research team, that makes life a little bit easier because it's literally right in our backyard. And, um, and that's another reason that we're so excited to work on a, a very local project that has very national significance. Um, the bay itself is it's, it's quite, it's quite small. Um, it's only about 300 yards wide uh, at its opening. Uh, between the two points you can see here. We're, we're standing at the very back of the bay in this photograph and looking out towards the, the broad lake. Um, just in front of us is about a 25 foot bluff that goes down to the shoreline. And then that tapers of course out into the bay. The bay is only about 325 yards deep as far from the opening to the shoreline. So it's, it's not large um, and it's relatively shallow. Um, obviously, from the shoreline, it starts off uh, at zero feet deep, and 
At its mouth, it only reaches 15 feet deep, with the majority of the bay being less than 10 feet in depth. Um, and you know, for such a small area, it really uh, was host to very dramatic and important events that took place on October 13th of 1776. And one of the, you know, we have conflicting historical accounts of what happened on that day uh, in 1776. And one of the main goals of this project is to try to, uh, to, to add some clarity to our understanding of those events by locating features and collections of artifacts in and around Arnold's Bay that should shed, shed some light on that story. So while the activity here started, took place on October 13th of 1776, to get a full understanding of the importance of the site, we actually have to take a step a little bit further back to October 11th and the Battle of Valcor Bay. The Battle of Valcor Bay was the most significant naval conflict that took part, uh, took place on Lake Champlain during the American Revolution. Um, it's, you know, fall of 1776. Uh, up to this point, the Americans uh, had attempted to invade Canada and successfully in invaded Canada, at least until they got to Quebec um, during the winter of 1775 into 1776, where they were repulsed. And when British uh, reinforcements arrived early in 1776, the American forces were forced to retreat. And many of them fell back down to Lake Champlain and traveled up Lake Champlain, which is south in this case, because the lake actually empties to the north. And they established themselves at Skeensboro, modern day Whitehall, uh, and at the fortifications at Ticonderoga and Crown Point. Very quickly, the Americans set up set about building a fleet of ships um, at Skeensboro, which were then uh, rigged and armed at Fort Ticonderoga. And they were hoping to delay or, um, or deny uh, the expected invasion of Lake Champlain by British forces. Um, the British saw this as an opportunity to capture Lake Champlain, which you know, almost touches at its southern end, the very uh, northern, and of their headwaters of the Hudson River. This forming an all water route through, uh, you know, what was then a, a very vast wilderness. The idea here being that the, if the British were to capture this entire waterway, they could control the corridor from the St. Lawrence River all the way down to New York City and cut off the New England colonies from the rest of the rebelling colonies. The Americans, of course, were interested in stopping this from happening or at least slowing it down. And hence they built this fleet of vessels uh, on Lake Champlain. Meanwhile, the British were doing exactly the same thing at the very northern end of the lake at St. John's, where they were building some vessels from scratch. And they were also bringing vessels uh, from the St. Lawrence up th around the rapids of the Richelieu River to St. John, where they were completing them uh, or putting them back together. Some of them were brought up in pieces or brought over as kits. Um, throughout the summer of 1776, the shipbuilding arms race continued, uh, and ultimately these two fleets came to grips at the Battle of Valcor Bay on October 11th of 1776. Uh, Benedict Arnold, who was in charge of the American fleet at this point, um, chose a, a very clever position uh, behind Valcor Island, kind of between Valcor Island and the New York shore. In this position, he was hidden from observation. And as he knew that his uh, opponents would be having to come from the north uh, on a northerly wind, the, the fleet was in a position where it wouldn't be observed until the enemy fleet had sailed south past Valcour Island and then would notice the American fleet kind of up behind them to the north, tucked up behind Valcour Island. And this gave uh, the American fleet the advantage of uh, being able to ha have an anchored position behind Valcour Island. And many of the poor sailing British vessels were not able to beat up into the wind to come to grips with the American fleet. As you can see on this uh, map of the, of the battle on the right, some of the largest of the British vessels ended up well south of where the action was actually taking place and uh, didn't play a significant role in the main fighting. Uh, during the day on the uh, of October 11th. The fighting there started around 11 a.m. and continued until uh, nightfall. 
And while I could, you know, go on and on about the Battle of Valcoran, it's an enormously interesting subject in and of itself. That's not the purpose of today's talk. So we'll just briefly mention that the American fleet uh, probably took the worst um, of this combat, um, suffering at least 60 casualties and uh, sustaining significant damage to a number of their vessels. Um, including the gunboat Philadelphia, which you see here on the lower right, uh, which was hit by a 24 pound cannonball right up at the bow in the, near the stem of the vessel, which um, hit the boat just below the waterline and uh, caused that vessel to sink. Uh, in this painting on the lower right here, you see the crew of the gunboat Philadelphia escaping onto the row galley Washington. I think this is a good point to, to mention these two vessel types because they're going to play a big role in our discussion moving forward. The majority of the American fleet was made up of these two vessel types. There were eight gunboats like the Philadelphia that you see here on the lower right. Uh, on the picture in the upper left, it is the one that's down in the corner on the left. Um, those gunboats uh, were large open boats, about 54 feet long, 15 feet wide carried three uh, main guns and lots of small swivel guns and had a crew complement of about 45 men on board. The row galleys, which you see behind the sinking Philadelphia there, that is the row galley Washington. There were only three of those. Uh, these were two masted vessels and they carried a much larger complement of guns and men. And these were much more significant fighting vessels than the gunboats but there had only been time to complete three of these vessels before combat was uh, started in October. Um, as night fell, the Philadelphia sank um, one of the smaller American schooners. There were also a, a couple of small sailing schooners in the American fleet. The Royal Savage was set on fire because it had run aground at the very southern tip of Valcor Island and burned furiously. Um, the British uh, settled back uh, a little way and set up a blockading line stretching from the southern tip of Valcour Island over to the western shore, the New York shore. And while they maybe intended to have this be a pretty thorough blockade, it turned out it was somewhat porous. And in the middle of the night, the American fleet, realizing that they were short on ammunition and gunpowder, um, and that they were trapped in this location and likely to be finished off um, come daylight on October 12th, they took the bold move to attempt to escape through the British blockade and flee south or up Lake Champlain. To accomplish this goal, they put a, um, a shielded lantern in the back of each vessel that was shielded on three sides and therefore could only be seen from directly astern. The boats then lined up single file and they snuck through a gap in the British blockading line uh, just along the New York shore and fled south. They were uh, almost certainly aided by the fact that the Royal Savage was still burning furiously at the southern tip of Valcour Island and probably proved a, a great distraction or, or uh, drew many a, a weary British soldier's eyes towards that instead of towards the American fleet that was sneaking away. Throughout the, uh, the night of October, or the early morning of October 12th, the Americans uh, continued to row and sail south as they could. They took a brief stop near Schuyler Island um, to patch holes, to try to fix their rigging, to try to get themselves together to continue to flee south. At this point, they had to abandon two more of the gunboats, uh, the gunboat Spitfire, which sank into deep water and the gunboat New Jersey, which was, they attempted to sink or they thought was gonna sink. Uh, unfortunately, it did not completely sink and the British found it the next day and took it under their command. Now the British awoke on the morning of the 12th and realizing that their quarry had escaped, uh, looked to the south and saw sails on the horizon and set off in pursuit. Throughout the day on the 12th, the two fleets chased each other up Lake Champlain um, though there were several miles uh, between the, the, the two fleets and no uh, significant engagement took place during the 12th. Um, the vessels continued to, to travel southward uh, in the early morning of October 13th. And it was at this point that a northerly wind kicked up and that first helped to speed the British fleet along and bring them down onto the ragtag 
damaged and uh, weary American fleet. And they were able to catch up with the American fleet near Split Rock Mountain. And a very significant uh, two and a half hour running gun battle uh, was started at this point. The Row Galley Washington, uh, actually that, that was the Row Galley that was in the picture right uh, that we saw before with the Philadelphia crew escaping onto it, um, had, had been significantly damaged during the battle and one of its masts was shot away. So it was kind of lagging behind the rest of the American fleet and it was captured by the British as they closed in on the remainder of the fleet. Um, a couple of the better sailing um, vessels from the American fleet, including the Row Galley Trumbull, um, the gunboat New York, and uh, the hospital ship Enterprise had managed to pull pretty far ahead, but um, Benedict Arnold on the Row Galley Congress and four additional gunboats were still together and trying to escape south. These were heavily engaged by the British fleet. Um, in, this, in this case, they were, they were very, very badly outclassed by the Royal Navy crewmen and the better sailing vessels uh, um, in the British fleet. And they were sustaining significant damage. Realizing that um, having just watched the Washington get captured and realizing that that was probably gonna happen to his five remaining vessels, Arnold made the rather daring decision to run ashore uh, in Arnold's Bay. At the time, it was known as Ferris's Bay, and to set his vessels alight and uh, destroy them so that to deny their capture to the British fleet. Now, uh, the selection of Arnold's Bay or Ferris's Bay, uh, uh, as it was known, it was named after a homesteading family that lived on the bay uh, and operated a farm in the area. Um, was the selection of this bay was quite interesting and, and clever on, on Arnold's behalf. Um, the row galleys and gunboats of the American fleet were relatively shallow drafted vessels. That means it didn't take much water to float these boats. They could get into relatively shallow water much more easily than the large, uh, kind of more traditionally shaped sailing craft of the British fleet. So Arnold, knowing that this was a shallow bay, chose to, to bring his five remaining vessels into Ferris's Bay and to run them ashore. The British fleet, which uh, you know, attempted to follow them, quickly pulled up just outside the mouth of the bay, realizing that they would endanger their vessels if they pursued the Americans into the bay, and began to tack back and forth across the mouth of the bay, firing into Ferris's Bay at the American fleet and at the American uh, sailors and soldiers that were, you know, rapidly jumping overboard, uh, jumping off of their vessels into waist chest deep water, maybe deeper, and scrambling ashore with whatever they could carry. Um, Arnold ordered that the flags uh, be left flying on all uh, as a show of defiance on each of the vessels, and they were all set afire and burned furiously. Uh, the American troops escaped up the bluff and into the farm fields around the Ferris homestead. And we have some reports that they may have established a temporary line of defense uh, at the top of the bluff uh, in order to repel any British forces that came into the bay to try to capture the vessels. It doesn't appear that the British actually uh, made those efforts or no significant efforts in that regard, but they were more than happy to keep firing round shot and grape and canister shot into the bay uh, to try to uh, kill as many of them escaping Americans as they could. Um, once the American forces were confident that the fleet was well in, engulfed in, and there was no chance that the British were gonna be able to save those vessels, they headed off south overland, taking the Ferris family with them and made their way 12 miles um, down towards Crown Point and the uh, American fortifications there. Now keep in mind that these, these poor American soldiers and sailors had been uh, probably without a, a good meal, uh, without any significant sleep, and had been under tremendous stress for at least three solid days. They were weary of rowing, fighting, watching their compatriots get wounded or killed, 
And I'm sure they were frantic to get out of these boats, get ashore and get away. So, um, you know, the, that was kind of the end of the activities on October 13th, as we understand them. But the, 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 the history of, of Ferris's Bay and which very rapidly became known as Arnold's Bay afterwards because of these events, um, obviously continued and, and still plays a significant role in uh, shaping our understanding of what happened in Arnold's Bay. And that's because those wrecks in the bay continued to be um, visible for many years. Uh, you know, bits of historic curiosity for travelers. Um, some of the first people to come back and explore those wrecks were the British forces who came back several days after this and recovered uh, at least 20 cannon from out of these wreckage and what other, whatever other material they could find uh, and recovered those and reused them. Um, throughout the 19th century, we have documentation, uh, newspaper reports, mostly of people collecting pieces and parts off of some of these boats and using the lumber for, for various things. Um, it appears that three of the gunboats, right? So it burned in the bay here. We had four gunboats and the Rogue Alley Congress. Uh, throughout the 19th century, three of the gunboats were pulled out of the lake and disassembled uh, and sold uh, bits and pieces of them sold as souvenirs or their lumber incorporated into uh, other projects and, and buildings, perhaps. Um, in, the 1890, in 1891, um, the local ferry that operated out of Arnold's Bay, which you can see in the background of the upper left-hand picture here, um, was operated by the Adams family they uh, grabbed on to the stern end of the wreckage from the Rogue Alley Congress and pulled off a big section of it, which you can see here on the shoreline. This is about a 30 foot long section um, of the Rogue Alley and it includes the keel, uh, a big section of the stern deadwood. That's kind of the triangular piece off to the left hand end, um, a number of frames and a piece of the keelson, which is the longitudinal timber that sits on top of the, uh, of the frame elements you can see there. Um, unfortunately, this piece, uh, the majority of this wreckage has also been lost to history. Um, it resided here on the beach as a curiosity for a number of years, ultimately made its way down to Chimney Point, uh, which is right where the Champlain Bridge is located um, and was displayed outside of the hotel there on the Vermont side of the bridge uh, and eventually rotted away. Um, thankfully, we have uh, two of the frames from this vessel were retained and have made their way into the, the collection of the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum where we have them for analysis. And I think we'll get a look at one of those in a later presentation. Um, after the 19th century, people continued to explore uh, and examine Arnold's Bay. Um, in the 1930s, the cannon on the lower right of this slide was located by Paul Bill Huber, who was a, I guess you would call him a diver. Uh, he actually dove in Arnold's Bay with a homemade diving helmet, um, which scares the hell out of me just even uh, mentioning it, but he apparently stomped around on the bottom at the mouth of Arnold's Bay for a number of days before he stumbled upon this cannon and recovered it, displayed it outside his uh, summer camp at, base, at the Basin Harbor Club for a number of years. And uh, this piece has also made its way into the collection um, of the Maritime Museum. It's quite likely this is a small four pound cannon, uh, quite likely that it was dumped off of one of the vessels as it was coming, as they were coming into, the, um, into Ferris's Bay uh, during the escape. Uh, but it's, it's a definitely an interesting little piece of history. Um, in the 1960s, uh, a small group of avocational archaeologists visited the, uh, the, the re remaining remains of the Rogue Alley Congress. Uh, this was 1960 and 1961, I believe, and they spent a week each summer excavating the interior of the vessel. That involved removing all of the ballast stones that they found in the hall remains and recovering about 1300 artifacts from uh, inside the, the Congress hall remains. Um, 
Luckily, those a, a good portion of those artifacts have also been returned to the Navy and are curated at the Maritime Museum, where they are forming a very important part of the study um, that we are conducting of Arnold's Bay. And lastly, uh, in 1952, we have the recovery of the last of the four gunboats. Um, in 1952, Lorenzo Hagland, who had become famous for the recovering the sunken Philadelphia from the Battle of Valcor Bay site that we talked about previously, um, decided, turned his attention to this gunboat in Arnold's Bay. And using the same technique that he had employed at Valcor to recover the Philadelphia, which involved uh, putting slings under the boat and then lifting it with uh, these empty tar barrels, 55 gallon drums, which he filled with water, sank, tied them off to those straps, and then pumped water into the, or pumped air into the drums, and slowly that lifted the, the boat off of the bottom, and they were able to tow it away. Um, sadly, this, this vessel uh, suffered the same fate as the other gunboats and the stern section of the Rogale Congress, in that it was, it was put up on shore, actually over on the New York side of the lake near the mouth of Osable Chasm, um, where Hagland had hoped to start a maritime museum to display this amazing piece of wreckage, along with the remains of the Vermont, which is the very first steamboat to ever operate on Lake Champlain that was built in 1809. And sadly, that museum never came to fruition. Uh, these two amazing pieces of history rotted away and were eventually bulldozed. Um, and destroyed. And this, this is now the location of a campground near the mouth of all Sable Chasm. Luckily, we do have a number of great photographs and some basic documentation that was carried out of these pieces of wreckage um, in the 1960s. Um, you know, when the Champlain Maritime Society, which was a precursor to the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, started to work around Lake Champlain, uh, Arnold's Bay was one of the first areas that they uh, spent an extensive amount of time. In 1984 and 85, they did a lot of in-water um, diving. They did these big circle searches all across the bay looking for uh, any remains of the American fleet. They did relocate the, the remains of the Congress. They found it to be very uh, eroded. And, uh, and mostly buried, only a few frame tips sticking up out of the mud. They noticed a lot of other scattered timbers and uh, material around the bay, including a part of a gun carriage, a cannon carriage, uh, and another number of other loose timbers. Uh, later in the 1980s, uh, research focus shifted to the Ferris homestead itself, which you can see indicated with the black arrow here on the upper picture on the slide. The Ferris's homestead uh, was very well known to all travelers and, and soldiers on both sides of this conflict in 1776. Um, and uh, Arnold certainly knew the place well, and he knew the Ferris's bay well, which is why he selected to drive his fleet in there. The homestead itself is located right on the edge of the bluff. And uh, by this point in the 1980s, that bluff was receding into the field and the foundation of the homestead was falling into the lake. So it was determined to uh, conduct a, a pretty thorough excavation and documentation of the structure before it was lost to history. Um, this excavation was uh, headed by David Starbuck, um, who was a, a, is a well-known uh, respected uh, archeologist of uh, French and Indian War and Revolutionary War sites throughout the Hudson and Champlain Valley. They were able to document the, the remaining cellar hole uh, of the Ferris homestead and located uh, quite a collection of interesting artifacts that have also become a, an important component of our ongoing research today. And lastly, in 2001, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum archaeology staff conducted uh, an additional kind of reconnaissance in Arnold's Bay just to assess the condition of the known um, structures in the bay. Um, those divers did relocate the remains of the Congress 
I know it's you probably going to have to trust me on this, but this piece of timber that's sticking up out of the out of the mud here is actually a plank from the Rogue Alley Congress. There is another here next to it. I know it looks just like all the rocks and stuff around it, but trust me, you get get an eye for these things eventually, and we'll see what this structure looks like today here in in, in the next slide. During this 2001 documentation, they uh, documented the location of the Congress well and noted uh, other scattered timbers and pieces around the site. But other than that, didn't really disturb the site at all. And that, and that brings us to, to where we are today. Um, when we returned to the site in the spring of 2021, um, we pretty quickly relocated the Congress site. Um, in fact, the you know as you may know the lake level was relatively low for almost the entire summer last year and we were able to visually see this some of this debris from from the surface on the boat and we sent some divers in to record what was exposed and we've basically used that location uh, the remains of the congress as our center point for where we wanted to start our greater analysis of the entire arnold's bay battlefield what we found uh, underwater there were um, a number of piece, a number of frame tips sticking up out of the mud that represented the forward half of the Rogue Alley Congress. Um, this picture in the upper left here is a still from a photogrammetry model of that same plank that we had seen from the 2001 photograph. That's this one here. Um, but you can see here that it's also attached to two frames. These are the ribs of the vessel ceiling planking, which is the interior hall planking, as well as the two um, outer hall planks that we saw in the uh, previous photograph. Additionally, we noted two large piles of ballast. Um, you know, these were these are pretty obvious uh, features on the bottom of the lake. The, the rest of Arnold's Bay is kind of a, a mixed uh, sandy mud bottom with uh, pretty significant weed growth. And then there are these two random, seemingly random piles of stone. And uh, it turns out that these are the ballast that was in the bottom of the vessel that gave it stability when it was sailing. Um, this pile that's in the photograph here was found off of what would have been the stern or the aft portion of the uh, Rogue Alley Congress and may have been deposited here when that stern section was broken off in the 1890s and pulled ashore. The other ballast pile is located just off to what is presumed to be the port side of the uh, Congress remains. And that was placed there by the avocational archeology span that took place here in 1960 and 61. Um, in conversations with Bill Leach, who was one of the members of that dive team, um, he mentioned that they, they found this ballast pile inside the wreckage and that as they were excavating it, they removed the rocks and placed them just outside of the structure. And that's exactly what we found when we went back in 2021. So that kind of gives you uh, an idea of the extent of the remains that are visible these, uh, at this point. It's not much, um, but it's just enough to make it um, quite interesting and intriguing and something we want to focus on more in 2022, uh, once we have our Navy permitting in place. So with the Congress remains in mind and its location, it's, uh, we started to think about the larger questions that we wanted to answer about uh, the events of October 13th of 1776. And we determined that the best way to answer those questions uh, to, to better understand the sequence of events, the location of events of that day, um, and, and to get a better idea of, of the people and the equipment that was used that day was to conduct remote sensing surveys of both in water and onshore portions of the battlefield site. Now we had originally uh, outlined this enormous area in red at the bottom of Arnold's Bay that we wanted to explore. Uh, as we'll get into with, uh, with Ed's presentation next, we've had to refine that box a little bit to a little bit more realistic size. That's a tremendous amount of bottom lands to look at. And with the now known remains of the Congress, we've, we've focused uh, the in-water survey in that area. We also wanted to get a better understanding of what 
artifacts might be present on the transitional zone along the shoreline between the lake and the land. And then we wanted to get, uh, that's represented by the yellow box here on this map. And then we wanted to understand what features and artifact concentrations might be found in the farm fields that surrounded Arnold's Bay and that are located near the Ferris Homestead site. So these, uh, this is the basic area that we were hoping to work in and kind of gives you the foundation of, uh, of our thought process for the presentations that you're gonna hear coming up next. Um, so there's, that's your history and background, uh, both the historic background and the previous archeology span and previous recovery work that's happened at Arnold's Bay. Um, as Susan did an excellent job of before, I won't read through all of our project uh, sponsors and partners, but um, you know, we thank everyone, we thank everyone for their support and hard work on this project. And I think we can transition right into a short question and answer about that before we hear from Ed Skolin on the about the in-water work at Arnold's Bay. I will stop sharing here if I can. Thank you so much, Chris. And yeah, folks, we do have a few uh, minutes to answer questions um, before we move on to the next talk. So feel free to submit things to the Q&A section at the bottom. Um, if we don't get a chance to do it now, uh, we will definitely, we can circle back around to it in the larger Q&A section at the end. Um, we do have a quick question um, from Peter Feynman as far as uh, who owns the property now? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, the property is owned by the Hopper family, uh, Dennis and Vicki Hopper, and they've been very gracious and welcoming and uh, encouraging us to better understand uh, what took place there. And um, uh, that's, that's something that's really important to notice, to note is that this is all private property and uh, you will be hearing a lot about the work that we did on this property uh, in coming presentations, but let it be known that this is private property. The in-water work, um, the bottom of the bay, of course, is uh, as a portion of Lake Champlain is owned by the state of Vermont. And the work that's done there uh, archeologically is all done through uh, a permit process uh, from the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation who are also great um, supporters of the project and uh, participated in it when they were able to. Excellent. I think we've got time for at least one more. Um, from David Lacey, we have, was there much evidence near the Ferris farm of grape shot and other munitions that were shot from the British ships towards escaping soldiers and sailors? Sure, I don't wanna give away anybody else's, uh, you know, exciting revelations uh, in further uh, presentations that we're gonna have. But one of the reasons that we selected that area uh, of farm fields that included, <clears throat> excuse me, included the Ferris Homestead was because during the 1980s excavations at the homestead, they did recover a couple of uh, pieces of probably grape shot, iron shot. And we do have some historic um, accounts of the, the Ferris Homestead being hit by at least one uh, piece of cannon shot during that exchange. So yes, there were some things found there. Excellent. All right. And unfortunately, we, I think we will need to move on, but we'll definitely, we'll keep all these questions for the end Q&A session, but I will turn it back over to Chris to introduce our next speaker. Sure. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have a presentation about the in-water survey methods that we used uh, in our examination of the bottom of Valcor, uh, I'm sorry, the bottom of Arnold's Bay. And this presentation is being given by Ed Skolan. Ed Skolan is a longtime volunteer at the Maritime Museum, and Ed was one of the driving forces behind the uh, earlier examination uh, of the Valcor Bay battlefield site, which was conducted um, in the late 90s and early 2000s uh, and involved very rigorous metal detecting survey at the bottom of the lake. And we've, uh, Ed's going to discuss how we adapted those uh, previous methodologies to our work here in uh, Arnold's Bay. Ed is a retired New York State police diver um, and, and uh, an avid historian of all things Revolutionary War and is uh, uh, 
the most knowledgeable person about this topic, and I'm excited to hear his presentation, as I'm sure you will be as well. As well. So I think we're going to go ahead and play that presentation now. Hello, I'm Ed Scollin. I'm a research associate for the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum in Virginia, Vermont. Today I'll be presenting the American Revolution Underwater, mapping submerged battlefields in Lake Champlain. From its inception, the main focus of the museum has been the research, study, and interpretation of the engagements between American and British forces upon the lake during the Revolutionary War. Most notable was the 1776 Battle of Alcor Island, but the Battle of Alcor Island was actually a moving engagement. The engagement began at Alcor, but it didn't end until three days later in a bay that is now known as Arnold's Bay. Physical evidence of those heavy engagements lay strewn across the lake floor from Valcor to Arnold's Bay and many points in between. Those remnants have been subjected to environmental and human disturbance ever since. Among many of the museum's efforts to locate, document, and interpret what remains, we have committed considerable time and resources to the Valcor Bay Research Project, an extensive archaeological survey of the submerged battlefield at Valcor Island. The Valcor survey began as a response to the discovery of a cannon buried deep within the lake bed. Not only had the base sediment protected that artifact by concealing it from view, the anaerobic environment had left it nearly perfectly preserved. At the start of the Valcor survey in 1999, archaeological use of metal detectors was still emerging. Now, especially with battlefield archaeology, it's become an accepted and invaluable tool. With both the Valcor and Arnold Bay surveys, our tool of choice was and remains the J.W. Fisher's Pulsate X metal detector. The Pulsate X is designed for rigorous underwater use and is waterproof to depths of 250 feet. As its name implies, the Pulsate X employs pulse induction technology. As opposed to very low frequency metal detection, pulse induction offers much deeper penetration of the terrain sediments. It's especially useful at Valcor where those sediments extend to several feet of depth. Our initial efforts were to excavate the cannon and survey the area around it. It wasn't long before we determined that the cannon was a six pounder designed to fire six pound shot. We also found that the gun was fragmented. It had split between its trunnions and the rest of the gun was missing. Our investigation of the surrounding area uncovered a number of associated artifacts. They were composed of a wide range of materials and were also found to be in remarkable states of preservation. We realized that many more remnants from the battle may still lay hidden, protected, and undisturbed. We found we had a rare opportunity, and our investigations would ultimately expand into several years of survey in our effort to uncover more of the American line of battle. During the winter months between our first and second season of survey, we became aware of the historical context of the cannon site. Researcher George Quintel had spent decades studying the pension records of Revolutionary War veterans. A few months before the discovery of the cannon, George had located the pension record of Jonas Holden. In 1776, Holden was a resident of Westford, Massachusetts. He was a member of a detachment sent from his regiment to support the Northern Army at Ticonderoga. There he was deployed upon one of Arnold's gondolas. In the depositions he submitted to obtain his pension, Jonas had recounted the bursting of one of the ship's cannons during the Battle of Valcor Island and suffering injuries to his right arm and side. George Quintel investigated Holden's account further. In Westford Fairview Cemetery, George found another account of the incident, this time written in stone. The explosion of the cannon had taken the life of Westford resident, Lieutenant Thomas Rogers. Rogers' grieving widow, Molly, had erected the monument to his memory there the tangible reminder of the great cost of war. It was over that same winter that John Townsend, an historical book dealer from Connecticut, made maritime researchers aware of a remarkable document in his possession. The document was produced at Ticonderoga and dated October 22, 1776. It was entitled, A Return of the Fleet Belonging to the United States of America on Lake Champlain under the command of Brigadier General Arnold. For Valcor researchers, this is the holy grail of documents. It recorded the vessels by class, 
by name, and by whom they were commanded. It also lists the guns with which they were armed, the numbers by which they were manned, and the ultimate fate of each vessel. It helped maritime researchers confirm the identity of the gondola that they located in 1997 as the Spitfire. For the Valcor survey, it also helped confirm the split cannon was from the New York. The New York was originally christened the Success. The vessel took the name New York sometime after its deployment with the fleet, most likely because the city was under siege at the time the vessel joined the fleet in mid-September. The return lists Reed as the vessel's captain. Justice Holden had recounted that Reed was his superior upon the gondola to which he was deployed. It also lists the gondola as being armed with two six-pounders as waste guns, further evidence that the split cannon once belonged to the New York. We were off to an incredible start, and as our survey continued in the seasons that followed, it developed into a unique integration of the disciplines of submerged cultural resource management and battlefield archaeology. We developed a survey methodology that mitigated many of the challenges that are inherent in working in an underwater environment and optimized our ability to systematically survey a vast area of submerged terrain, as well as developing methods for studying and documenting what we encountered there. Of all conditions encountered while conducting underwater surveys, limited visibility is one of the greatest challenges. Neither the Valcor or Arnold's Bay sites are of a depth where ambient light never becomes much of an issue. However, because of their silty bottomlands, any disturbance of that silt can cause it to become suspended in the water column. Visibility can be reduced to inches in a matter of seconds. In those conditions, it's very easy for divers to become disoriented as to their location, their direction, and their depth. Despite that challenge, we also found that we could use the lake bed sediments to our advantage. While excavating the cannon, we discovered that the clay was of a consistency that we can embed and deploy a system of PVC posts. Those posts could be marked with positional information, deployed in a system aligned with magnetic north, and used as a means for divers to navigate about the site by compass. They would prove to be especially helpful during times of silting, with excavation, or when visibility was reduced due to natural causes. We could also use those same posts to form the corners of survey grids, use them as anchors for tape measures, and employ them to investigate the area surrounding the cannon site. We developed a system of 50-foot grids deployed in a manner to optimize our underwater orientation and our visibility. A 50-foot grid may appear to be a dawning area of the survey, but in conducting our underwater investigations, maintaining neutral buoyancy in a position above the bay floor is essential to maintaining our visibility. Long transects of survey reduce the number of times that the divers have to change direction. This makes it easier for them to stay on a level plane, maintain their buoyancy, and keep them from inadvertently making contact with the bottom. The corner posts of each of our 50-foot grids would remain in their original positions throughout the course of the survey as navigational guides across the site. During active survey, tape measures would be strung along the north and south sides of each grid. A fence of half-inch PVC posts would then be embedded at three-foot intervals along both sides. A third tape measure would then be strung between corresponding posts in a north-south orientation. It provided a visual transect for the divers to follow. The three-foot spacing was made when finding a surveying diver could easily swing the coil of the metal detector two feet laterally to each side of their transect. This spacing provides for a one-foot overlap between transects and ensures thorough coverage. Tasks were split between a team of two divers, one dedicated to conducting the metal detection survey, and the other dedicated to recording their efforts and the locational information of any metallic anomalies that they encountered. The placement of these posts allowed the survey to progress without interruption, and the targets could be investigated later when currents and available personnel were at an optimum. From its onset, a primary objective of the Valcor project was to involve local divers in promoting a stewardship ethic within the community. The survey team was already comprised of many instructors and divers certified through Plattsburgh's YMCA scuba program. In our second year of survey, former members of the Lake Champlain Archaeological Associates also joined our ranks. All were invaluable in the experience they brought to the team. Both groups approached diving with the highest of safety and ethical standards. The museum's Maritime Research Institute 
was comprised of a number of divers who were also dive instructors associated with Burlington's Waterfront Dive Center. In a typical survey year, the survey was conducted by local divers throughout the dive season. We meet with the MRI team midsummer for a two week combined survey. Over the course of the project, nearly 60 divers participated in the survey. Several others provided valuable surface support. In 2001, we received permits from both New York State and the US Navy to recover and conserve a selected number of the artifacts that we had encountered. In our second year of survey, we became aware of a small group of divers that had been exploring the west side of the bay. We invited them to assist us with the survey as well as our preparations for the 2001 recovery. We also encouraged them to continue with their explorations under permit. Our survey permit was expanded to include their efforts along the west end of the American line as the survey continued beyond the 2001 recovery. They were instrumental in the preparations for the cannon's final lift to the surface. Greg DeRocher, Dennis O'Neill, and Phil LaMarche went on to survey a large area of the western side of the bay. Their survey greatly contributed to our understanding of the American line of battle and their discoveries helped spur a second recovery effort in 2006. Tony Tyrrell, already a working member and contributor of the Valcor project, also went on to study the area surrounding Savage Rock under that expanded permit. Over the course of eight years of meticulous systematic survey, we completed nearly 100 of those 50-foot grids. Our survey encompassed nearly seven acres of the American line of battle. From the artifact scatter, we were able to determine stations taken by several of the ships from Arnold's fleet. We also believe we determined the location of where the gondola Philadelphia sank shortly after the battle and from where Colonel Lorenzo Hagelin's team recovered her in 1935. We encountered a wide range of shot, including a surprising number of howitzer shells. The American fleet was being attacked from every available angle. From archival research and the artifact scatter, we were able to identify the gunboat upon which the cannon had burst. It occurred upon the gondola in New York. By knowing the specifications to which the gondolas were built, we were able to bring those dimensions into context with our precise recording of the artifact scatter. We were not only able to interpret the position of the New York had taken when the cannon exploded, we were able to trace her movements as the crew cleared her decks of debris following that tragic event. We were also able to determine that the cannon was used as a waste gun upon the New York. It was a Swedish Finbanker, a six pounder that had been forged nearly a full century before this battle. It had fragmented into at least seven pieces. We found six thus far, about 90% of the gun. The left trunnion and a small section aft of it are still missing. What's more is that it appears that adaptations were made to have the gun mounted on a carriage that was originally designed for a larger gun. We found significant evidence that it wasn't only dangerous for American crews to stand before the guns of their enemy, but also behind the guns of their own. The project successfully demonstrated the strength of collaboration and the power of provenience. We were quite literally able to paint a much better picture of what transpired upon the bay during that crucial battle in 1776. The survey also demonstrated that Valcor is arguably among the best preserved battle sites of the Revolutionary War. It deserves further study, interpretation, and protection. The work of the Valcor Bay Research Project didn't end there. The Moment in Time exhibit has traveled to venues in Plattsburgh, Fort Ticonderoga, Saratoga, Albany, Washington, D.C., and Westford, Massachusetts. The work is still interpreted in the Maritime Museum's Key to Liberty exhibit and through presentations such as this. Thanks to the work of Roger Harwood and Pat Parker, many of the elements of the original exhibit are displayed to summer visitors of Valcor Island's lighthouse. We were excited to finally apply what we had learned from all those years of working at Valcor to our submerged survey of Arnold's Bay in 2021. We were even more excited about the potential to coordinate our efforts with those of the AMDA, the Advanced Metal Detecting for the Archaeologist Group. A terrestrial survey class had been scheduled at Arnold's Bay in October. Directing our work to facilitate the success of their survey became one of our greatest goals.
Determining the location of the Galley Congress was the best place for us to start in our submerged survey of Arnold's Bay. Of the five original wrecks, it's the last that's known to remain in the bay. The wreck of the Congress is under the protection of the U.S. Navy. Any excavation of the wreck is under the direction and the control of their Naval Historical Center. We had yet to obtain permits to excavate the Congress. Locating the wreck wasn't only crucial to ensuring we didn't inadvertently impact her remains, but to determining how best to direct our survey. Using positional notes from former surveys and interviewing a member of a prior excavation, we located the forward section of the Congress relatively quickly. General Arnold's objective of running the Congress into the bay was to run her aground and destroy her. With a draft of a little over six feet, that's about where we found her. We found the tips of frames indicating that the bow was pointing towards the North Shore. A large pile of ballast stones were located aft and to the south. Knowing that her stern had been separated from the rest of the hull in the late 1800s and pulled on shore, our first efforts were to try to determine the aftmost footprint of the wreck without impacting the site. In 2020, we interviewed Bill Liege, one of three researchers that had excavated the Congress in the early 1960s. Liege had recounted emptying the hull of its ballast. We decided to lay out a transect after the ballast pile. Our initial hopes and inclinations had been to employ the methodology that we had employed at Valcor. It was here that we began to find our methodology would have to deviate from what we had used there. The bay opens to the northwest and from where it's exposed to the predominant winds. With over four miles of fetch from the aptly named Northwest Bay, these waves build considerably as they reach the shallower waters along the Vermont shoreline. These waves greatly erode the shale bluffs at the bay's mouth. There's an interplay between the sediments that wash into the bay from a stream at its deepest point and the waves that wash in this eroded shale. These photos show how this stone is washed over one of the points at the mouth of the bay when the lake is at its highest levels. It's the same material that we find washed deep into the bay. Besides a bottom that consists of heavy clay, there is also the presence of a significant amount of this stone. The result is a stratification which in many ways resembles a loose concrete before it's had a chance to fully cure. We found it next to impossible to embed any sort of post or anchor into the lake bed here. Instead, we used concrete blocks to anchor our transects and recorded their placement with GPS. Since we also encountered a moderate level of seaweed, we employed a rope line as our visual transect. It enabled us to pull the line taut and ensure that it wasn't bowed by obstructing vegetation. A tape measure was then deployed alongside to record the locations of any metallic anomalies that we encountered along the way. Over the course of a few days, we ran our survey along this transect and we discovered a number of small 18th century artifacts. We also encountered timbers of the wreck, which were located beyond the ballast pile. Being uncertain as to whether some remain intact with the hull of the Congress or were disarticulated structure, we postponed any further survey along that transect. We'll return when permits are in place for further excavation. By now, we also had a much better appreciation of the contours of the Congress's bow section. We also had some fresh insights that we gleaned from photographs in the Maritime Museum collections. The photos were of Lorenzo Haglund's excavation and removal of a gondola from the bay in 1952. Those photos appear to indicate that the gondola once rested to the Congress's starboard side. With this in mind, we chose to deploy a second transect in the fashion that we had with the first to the starboard side of the wreck in parallel to the shoreline. From this position and further into the bay, depths recede to just a few feet. Arnold and his men had run their vessels as close to shore as possible. We envisioned that the crews had transitioned to the shoreline much as U.S. Marine artist Colonel Charles Waterhouse did in his depiction of that event. By placing the second transect here, we could investigate the potential of the 1952 excavation being to that side of the Congress, as well as an area where some of the American crews may have come ashore. What we learned might help AMDA instructors determine where best to direct their upcoming survey. Now that we are working in much shallower water, we found the need to further deviate from the methodologies that we had employed at Valcor while we continued with our submerged survey. 
At Valcor, we conducted the survey employing redundant air supplies in the form of pony tanks, and the survey was conducted in teams of two. Those were safety measures taken due to the depths that we were diving at and the physiological constraints posed by breathing compressed air at depth over time. We didn't have those constraints in the shallows of Arnold's Bay. Redundant air supplies were not only unnecessary, but burdensome. And now that we were working at depths that barely required the use of scuba, impacting the bottom was that much more probable. Surveying divers could easily be monitored from the shoreline or boat. And if the diver did encounter an equipment or air supply issue, the situation could be remedied by simply standing up. A safety diver was no longer necessary and an additional diver would only contribute to the potentials of silting and reduced visibility. So while working here, it made more sense for the survey investigations to be conducted by a single diver. Another significant difference from working at Valcor is that Valcor Bay really isn't a bay, it's a strait. The lake's currents run through it, relatively unimpeded. When we initially investigated our targets there, it was a practice to move the uppermost layers of silt away with the sweep of a hand and allow the current to clear our view. We didn't have that luxury at Arnold's Bay. Without any significant current and working in a very shallow water column, any suspended silt wouldn't settle out for a considerable period of time. Here in the shallows, we weren't expecting to find artifacts of the size and condition that we had at Velcor. Anything that had remained following the destruction of the fleet had been exposed to the extremes of climate, wave action, boat traffic, and collecting ever since. What still remains is most likely to be fragmented or small. The dense lake bed wouldn't easily accept the placement of anomaly posts, as the loose clay did at Valcor. And here, there was a significant risk of damaging what did remain by their attempted placement. We also came to the realization that we were going to experience some level of silting and reduced visibility, no matter when we chose to investigate our targets. We then concluded that it would save considerable time and effort to investigate the anomalies that we encountered as we encountered them. Fortunately, we found we had a tool that we hadn't had at Velcor. The use of a pinpointer presented a very suitable answer to investigating our targets in the shallows. We already had Garrett brand, model Pro Pointer ATs, on hand for our upcoming participation in the AMDA survey. Those Garrett pinpointers were rated as waterproof to depths of 20 feet. We were working well above that depth along our second transect. The survey then proceeded by a combined use of both the Pulsate X and the pinpointer. The Pulsate X had the range to identify targets and the pinpointer allowed us to investigate those targets with an almost surgical level of precision. The pinpointer sensitivity is adjusted by the use of one button. A series of audio signals and or vibrations indicates its level of sensitivity. With a little practice, we found we could adjust the sensitivity regardless of our visibility. The pinpointer would allow us to hone in on our targets. We caused less disturbance to the lake bed during our investigations, and our visibility would be affected to a much lesser degree. We spent several days of productive survey along that transect. A sole investigator would move along the transect with the Pulsate X and pinpointer. They would record the locations of encountered anomalies along the transect, along with the distance to either side of the transect tape. Anomalies would be investigated as they were encountered. Artifacts would be recovered and placed in Ziploc bags with pre-designated tags. That designation would be recorded along with the artifact's locational information on a Mylar clipboard, and the investigator would proceed with their survey. If the investigator's visibility should become greatly diminished, they could make note of their progress and move on to another area where visibility was more workable. Transects are run until no further anomalies are encountered. As the survey continues and we work out in the deeper portions of the bay, we may find we can return to some of the methodologies that we employed at Valcor. But as far as the shallows of Arnold's Bay are concerned, we found these adaptations to be the most productive. What we are able to uncover at Arnold's Bay may not reach the scale of what we achieved at Valcor, but the survey there is no less in importance in our attempts to learn more about these three crucial days of the American Revolution. We may be surprised to find that there still is plenty to uncover, just like we did at Valcor. Our efforts to investigate, study, 
can serve and protect what's left to uncover there and points in between will continue. One of the greatest goals of the Valcor Bay Research Project was to involve the public, especially local divers, in those efforts. And therein lies the greatest of our successes. It was and remains a collaborative effort of national, state, and local institutions, agencies, and citizen volunteers. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of the experiences of our work at Valcor and Arnold's Bay. Many thanks to all those who have dedicated their efforts, time, and resources towards these projects. I'd like to dedicate this presentation to the memory of Richard Doc Heilman. Doc was a selfless, dedicated contributor and friend to all of us on the project. He and the Great Republic greatly contributed to making our work accessible, comfortable, and safe. We miss him. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ed, for that wonderful presentation. It was so excellent to get to see so much of your diving footage. Um, so we do have some time to take a couple questions before we go on to the next talk. Um, so feel free to submit to the Q&A section and we'll try to get through as many as we can. All right. How about to start us off? Um, is there any, um, from Jason Reed, it looks like we have, is there any permitting or permission also needed from the British Navy um, for any of the work that you've been doing? If it involves a British vessel, yes, um, it is required. Um, we ran into that with a survey we did with um, some people from Texas A&M off of uh, Fort Ticonderoga. Those vessels were British vessels um, and we did need permits. And, and unfortunately, we didn't get those permits and our survey had to work around that. So yes, if it if it belonged to the British Navy at the time that it sank, it's uh, still under their control. Excellent. All right. And from Tom Mayering, um, the lake level has changed since 1776. Um, how far inland has it gone? That's a good question. And I don't have the answer for that. Yeah. Probably from what we're seeing, it's, it's not that much different from where we're seeing things with the shoreline, uh, where we're finding our things of that sort. I think it's relatively the same. There was a lot of erosion at Arnold's Bay, um, mm -hmm. especially. So um, that has changed. But half or actually almost all of the Ferris household has fallen down that floor. Um, they've taken some efforts to keep that from moving. Um, and it seems to have worked since the 80s. But as far as the water level goes, I don't think it was all that different. Maybe Crispin. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that the water level is, is relatively the same. You know, the outflow of uh, Lake Champlain through the Richelieu River is the same as it was in 1776. Um, we, as Ed mentioned, the erosion of the bluff at the back of the bay has been quite significant. Um, it's something that we don't really have a great, we can't quantify exactly how much it's eroded over time. Obviously, the, the Ferris homestead is a good indicator of how much it's eroded. I can't imagine that they built their homestead right on the edge of the bluff when they built it in uh, in the 18th century. Um, so it's certainly receded quite a bit since that time, um, but it has been stabilized at this point. Um, and that activity of stabilizing the bank is something that's going to impact the terrestrial uh, archaeological survey that is going to be discussed next. So that's something to keep in mind. Nice. Um, next up, we have uh, Jay Prindle, and he was, and his question is, uh, or they, their question is, excuse me, uh, was surveying done on Shiler, excuse me, Shiler Island um, and the surrounding lake area? Um, there has not been any formal surveying done there that I'm aware of. I know that there was uh, a lot of work that was done with side scan sonar in an attempt to locate uh, the Spitfire. Uh, a gunboat that the Maritime Museum did locate in 1997. As far as uh, in, in a dirt or a terrestrial survey, I don't believe there has been, at least I'm not aware of it. Excellent. And I think we've got time for at least one more um, from Joe Barnett. We have, where is the plaque and picnic table um, that was uh, featured in your presentation? That's right at the mouth of the bay. Um, it's actually a nice little park. Um, right there. I 
it's also if you know if you notice from the video, it's also a spot where uh, Chris keeps his extra smartphone fins. <laughs> yeah, that that is uh, that is a boat launch uh, right on the northern point uh, of Arnold's Bay. You have to drive drive past that large cement block building there, which is the Virgins Panton Water District's pumping station. I think there was a question about that as well from earlier. Um, and uh, right past that is this, it's actually a well-maintained and, and pretty useful boat launch, certainly for our purposes. And it seems to be quite active from our experience. And right there is where that uh, plaque monument um, is. And there's a, a little, uh, at least one picnic table there. It's a nice little spot. Excellent. All right. I know we've got a lot of other great questions, but just so we make sure all our presenters get enough time, I think we can move on to the next one, but Ed, we'll see you back for the final Q&A session at the end, but thank you again. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, great job, Ed. Um, our next presentation is gonna be about, um, from one of the principal members of the Advanced Metal Detecting for the Archaeologist Group, Joel Bohe. Um, this group is extremely experienced in metal detecting battlefield sites and we were overjoyed to have them partner with us for this uh, for the Arnold's Bay Research Project so they could bring their expertise and um, experience to bear on this uh, on this project. You know, at the Maritime Museum, we obviously have a considerable amount of experience of working in the water uh, and including using metal detectors as Ed so uh, thoroughly described in the in the last presentation. But we, uh, it, and particularly myself, have very little experience of working on land uh, and not at all with metal detectors. So the incorporation of AMDA crew into our project has been instrumental in, in achieving our goals. And so Joel is going to present about uh, AMDA's involvement in the project and their process and previous uh, work as well. Take it away, Joel. Hey, everybody. Thank you this presentation called A View from the Shore, AMDA Collaborations at Arnold's Bay and Beyond. In this presentation, we're going to discuss advanced metal detecting for the archaeologist and our collaboration with the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum on their Arnold's Bay project last fall. The site was the escape route for Benedict Arnold after his retreat down Lake Champlain after the Battle of Valcor Bay from October 11th to the 13th, 1776. And as you can see from the image, it's quite a beautiful site to work. Advanced metal detecting for the archaeologist. Who are we? Um, we're a group of professionals who um, take some time out of our lives and we go out and we train um, archaeologists in the proper use of metal detection um, for archaeological, archaeological projects, um, training in the proper use of methodology for metal detection on archaeological projects, uh, best practices for professional archaeologists, and we are an RPA certified course giving 24 credits under their continuing professional education program. So the history of AMDA, uh, the AMDA class was born in 2011. A um, group of archaeologists got together and recognized the need to teach best practices in metal detecting to archaeologists. Um, we saw that professional archaeologists were finally accepting that metal detecting was a valuable tool, uh, but had no good source of instruction. Um, you know, but prior to this time and still today, we see uh, issues with archaeologists uh, not liking metal detectors because they're used by relic hunters, um, but uh, they're an important tool for battlefields and um, and other projects where you're looking for metal. Uh, the first class was in 2011 in Helen, Georgia, and based on the response to the event, um, RPA uh, certified the course for continuing education and um, we decided to focus solely on instruction. After formalization of the instructor core, uh, the course offerings were certified by RPA and we are the first continuing education course to receive this certification. AMDA training, um, what we do is we teach specific objectives, um, gain an understanding of how metal detecting works, learn through case studies the range of resources and types that can be effectively examined through metal detecting, learn how to maximize the data return from metal detecting efforts, and one of the important ones is to gain a familiarity with the uh, various machines that are available, strengths, weaknesses, and price points. 
Um, that way students can try out a bunch of different machines and they can kind of learn from that and take back to their company um, the different experiences they've had with different equipment and hopefully pick up what they, uh, what they need to do the job properly for them. We also provide a lot of uh, reference material and um, we take them out in the field and they get to work on the proper methodologies involved in metal detecting. So the course usually starts with classroom time and what we do is we set up um, a classroom with slides to discuss um, important information for metal detector surveys, the history of metal detectors, proper planning, uh, budgeting for those that need to understand how to budget a project. Um, we go through the different types of equipment, um, how to record finds, field layout, uh, recon and research before project. And then what we try to do is get outside. Uh, we put some material on the ground so that people can um, start to get used to the equipment and the different readings that they get from different types of materials. So past AMDA courses, um, we've had them um, pretty much all over the country. Um, we've done 15 so far. Uh, Helen, Georgia would be the first one, Charlestown Landing, South Carolina, Winchester, Virginia, Stone Mountain, Georgia, Palo Alto, Texas, Kennesaw, Georgia, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Pensacola, Florida, uh, Fort Necessity in Pennsylvania, Buffalo, Wyoming, Bennington, Vermont, Sirocco, New Mexico, Carlsbad, New Mexico, Charleston, South Carolina, and at Arnold Bay, Vermont. We also uh, and volunteer on other projects um, and help out where needed, um, which is great for us also as we get to continue on our experience. Um, we bring uh, equipment skills to volunteer on other projects. We've done volunteer work at Minuteman National Historical Park, Massachusetts, Saratoga, New York, uh, twice working with uh, the Northeast Archaeological Resources Program and American Veteran Archaeological Recovery there. Uh, we've worked at Gettysburg, uh, Little Round Top pre and post burn, and uh, we've done some work on Culps Hill, um, Johnstown Flood Site in Pennsylvania, and uh, recently at Sagamore Hill in New York, uh, looking for Theodore Roosevelt's uh, gun range. We also have a lot of our own projects, uh, research projects going uh, a lot at the same time, um, including live fire ballistic study of arms from the American Revolution uh, through the Civil War, uh, ballistics, uh, bullet strike study. We're currently doing a research project on all known bullet strikes that remain from April 19th in structures and objects. And one of the instructors now is working on a, uh, a chapter for a book on history of conflict archaeology. So now we can talk about Arnold's Bay a bit and the class that we did up there. Uh, we first met about this at the Society for Historical Archaeology Conference in Boston. Um, and we decided we would uh, work on this program, um, team up with Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, and then COVID hit and we ended up being delayed until the fall of 2021. Uh, but we were finally able to get out into the field and, uh, and look at the project and do some research. So on August 20, 27th, 28th, 2021, uh, a group of us went up to Arnold Bay, met up with the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum folks, and we went out on a recon uh, to see what type of material uh, we were going to find uh, for the AMDA class. Um, we went out into the water a little bit and the beach and uh, a plateau up above where the troops retreated through uh, after coming ashore at the beach. Um, and this gave us an idea of what would be found in the ground. It also uh, gave us the lay of the land so that we could uh, gain some ideas on how we were going to lay out uh, the grids in the field uh, when we actually did the project. So the recon, uh, during the recon, we did find some period items. Uh, like I mentioned, we found a bayonet scabbard hook um, that had popped off of the bayonet scabbard in the water. Um, we found some musket balls um, and a piece of a broken cast iron pot that might have come back off of uh, the Congress, along with um, some large and small spikes um, that may have come from the boat also and trash. So on October 1st through the 3rd, 2021, we were finally able to hold the course. Um, and we started in the classroom 
uh, which is what we normally do. Um, however, we had bad weather coming in. Um, so we went through some basics in the classroom and uh, we had to shift our schedule a little bit um, so that we could get out into the field and we figured we would uh, put some of the classes in when the weather was, was bad. Uh, so Friday, a little bit of classroom time in the morning um, and then directly out into the field as it was a beautiful day and we knew that it was gonna be pouring fairly soon. So we got into the field um, that first day right after a few classroom training sessions to try and get uh, folks used to using the equipment. We had grids set up for them to work up above on the plateau near the Ferris House site. Uh, we also worked down on the shoreline um, and into the water. Uh, we had some folks go out a few feet into the water and, uh, and we covered the beach to a rise up to the plateau. And uh, we found some interesting things that helped us gain a clearer idea of what happened there in October 76, 76 as well as the uh, land use after that, that incident. So what did we find uh, in the field? Uh, we found uh, musket balls of various caliber. Uh, we found buttons, uh, some iron case shot that had probably been fired uh, by the British, uh, lead flint wrapper, and iron spikes, pot fragments. And we also found a lot of crap. Uh, but you know, when we're teaching these courses, um, it's the, the trash that's found is also important in understanding equipment, um, understanding the different tones um, that the machines make for ferrous and non-ferrous material. Um, so actually the trash on a site um, is a great tool for training purposes. And after we had finished the project, uh, and of course, uh, we had such a great time that uh, we continued to do some research uh, to, to share with Lake Champlain Maritime Museum on some of the material culture uh, that might be found on the land and, and on the bottom as the project continues. Um, and although not, not all of the, the sailors that were on the boats were from Massachusetts, uh, some of them were. And if they lost something, they could turn in a petition to the state um, for uh, monies for the things they lost. And in this petition, John Fulton uh, was on board one of the uh, row galleys and he lost, his gun was destroyed by a cannonball. Um, and I know that um, on some of these sites, some gun parts have been found. And sometimes these petitions <clears throat> can be very helpful in, in uh, explaining some of the material that's being found either on the bottom of the lake or on land. And I'll end with this petition uh, from Benjamin Berry. Uh, he was a, a soldier from Sudbury, Massachusetts. Uh, and like many of the uh, uh, soldiers that were put on board the boats, they were actually uh, at Ticonderoga in the Army, but they were plucked out uh, to be put into the Navy. Um, Benjamin Berry uh, was from the detachment and the brigade to serve aboard the fleet under the command of General Arnold and was wounded in the engagement on the lake on board the Rogue Alley Congress, which sits uh, right off the shore of, of Arnold's Bay. And he lost his left arm by a cannonball <clears throat> and sundry articles of arms and clothing, um, which he uh, put on the list. And an interesting story with Barry is he went on um, and continued on even with one arm, um, guarding stores in Concord and Sudbury, Massachusetts in 78 and 79. Um, and with it, uh, the second page of the petition, it lists everything that he lost with a price next to it, um, a gun and bayonet, um, blanket, coats and jackets, shirts, a hat, stockings, shoes, silk handkerchief, and a cotton handkerchief. Um, and some of these things, the shoes and shoe buckles that are listed in some of these petitions are what's being found on the bottom and on the shoreline. Um, so sometimes uh, doing a little bit of historical research into some of these petitions can actually be very helpful to um, understanding some of the finds that you're getting. And we get this great picture of happy Joe Balicki, which we don't often see. Uh, we want to say thank you to all those involved in the project, uh, American Battlefield Protection Program, uh, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, Register of Professional Archaeologists, uh, fellow colleagues at Advanced Metal Detecting for the Archaeologist, 
uh, Chris, Cher, and Ed from Lake Champlain, who are great to work with, and obviously all of those who participated in the class. Uh, we've got a couple others coming up, one in June at Valley Forge with a couple more planned for fall and into 2023. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you at one of the classes sometime. Thank you for watching. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, and thank you again for joining us today. No problem. Excellent. Um, so again, feel free to submit um, any questions you have to the Q&A feature at the bottom. We'll try to get a couple in. Um, from Joe Barnett, how does your equipment differ from the equipment used to search beaches today? Well, we use some of the same types of equipment. Um, in the class, what we try to do is have machines that range from, you know, three, four hundred dollars that you would use on the beach. And then we also have machines that are two thousand, five thousand dollars and up um, so that people can and try out different things. Obviously, with the lower end machines, um, you're not going to get um, as, as much depth as you can with a little more expensive machine. But, you know, what we try to do is is show all the different types of equipment so people can decide on their own what they like and uh, um, and what they want to use on their projects. Oh, nice, excellent. And we do have a follow-up question um, that one of our participants um, had used downward, downward looking radar. Is that the type of equipment used today? Um, we use, uh, like Ed was talking about, um, VLF machines, very low frequency. And they're basically the the standard machines that people use, like I said, uh, there are better machines and and such. But with what we're doing, we're not using a lot of radar. When we do other projects, um, people bring in those people to do the radar work. So we just kind of stick to the uh, metal detection. Excellent. Yeah, just to add on to that, you know, in water, as Ed mentioned, we use a, a slightly different technology with the metal detectors, and we use this pulse induction technology, which. I'm sure Joel understands much more thoroughly than I do. Uh, and it, uh, the, the benefit of the pulse induction technology is that it penetrates further into the, into the sediment, and into the lake bottom. However, it does not differentiate between the material types in the way that many of the terrestrial machines do. So we're getting better penetration, uh, but you just get a single tone. Yes, there's metal here, not, mm -hmm. oh, hey, it's brass or hey, it's iron. Um, which in, in our case is fine for the in-water work because we want to find uh, all material types and when we want the depth penetration uh, into the lake bottom to ensure that we're not missing anything. We, we also do use um, some pulse induction machines. Um, one of the problems with doing a class with a pulse induction machine is in order to get the depth um, what happens is those machines send out quite a signal so that if you're working with a VLF machine anywhere near them, the machines will go absolutely crazy. So we do have those machines in our toolbox, but we don't necessarily use them in the class. We do talk about them. Um, but yeah, you're right. We have used them in certain areas. I know at Gettysburg at Little Round Top or on the base of Little Round Top, we set up a grid where we cleaned it with VLF machines and then we went back through with pulse induction and the uh, amount of material we found uh, that was in the cleaned area was a lot. Mm. So, you know, a lot deeper, a lot deeper. Nice, excellent. No, that sounds great. Uh, well, thank you very much, Joel. And we'll bring you back for the uh, Q&A session at the end of our, present, uh, end of our program. Um, and Chris, I'll pass it on to you to introduce our next speaker. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to move on to the next one. And real quick, I just want to reflect back on some uh, a portion of, of both Joel and Ed's presentations. And that's the fact that, um, you know, the historic research and the historic documentation research that is still going on around this project and the Valcor Bay project uh, is enormously valuable. And it feeds the, the two the two projects feed each other information uh in the case of the valcor uh the, the best example is the canon right we, we found this canon we started to research the canon then we found the historical accounts of the canon bursting on the gunboat new york which informed us that this gun probably came from the gunboat new york and in, in the uh, pension records and these uh, petitions that Joel has located of material that was lost on board the vessels that were burned in Arnold's Bay is very much the same. It's informing us of the type of things that we should keep an eye out for as we do the work. 
which is in turn informing us of places to look for additional information. So these, these two processes really, uh, it's a circular research opportunity, uh, which is one of the things that makes it really exciting. And it is a good demonstration that bringing in multiple viewpoints is very important. And that's a good segue into our next presentation. Our next presentation is by Nathan Allison, who is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Stockbridge Muncie Band of the Mohicans. And the involvement of, uh, of Nathan and his colleagues is you know, one of the principal goals of our um, project um, through the American Battlefield Protection Program. We want to include as, as many viewpoints and uh, different data sets as possible in our research and include as many voices in this discussion as possible. So I'm going to turn it over to Allison to give uh, to Nathan Allison to give uh, his impressions of the project and, and his involvement in it. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum for inviting me to speak today. My name is Nathan Allison. I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and archaeologist for the Stockbridge Muncie community. I'm going to turn off my camera really quick so you're not just staring at a talking head and you can pay attention to my PowerPoint. Right. So uh, I'm not a, a tribal member. I, I represent the tribe's efforts in historic preservation, and I work from our Historic Preservation Extension Office located uh, in Williamstown, Massachusetts. I'm really happy to join you today, and we appreciate the opportunity to bring awareness to the work we do in historic preservation and celebrate the region's cultural heritage. Uh, today, I'm going to be discussing in general our program's participation in the Arnold's Bay Project. In 2020, the Stockbridge Muncie Community Tribal Historic Preservation Office was contacted to initiate Section 106 review of the project. Meaningful consultation led to collaboration on the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum's endeavor to delineate the Revolutionary War battlefield and answer some questions about the events as will be shared today. All too often, Native American participation in the American Revolution is relegated to footnotes. In this case, tribal members made up ranks of the Stockbridge militia in the engagement against the British at the Battle of Elker Bay. The Arnold Bay Project offered an opportunity to bring the, to the forefront of research the tribe's role in this battle. This paper provides a brief tribal history of the Stockbridge Muncie community and Stockbridge Militia's experience in the Revolutionary War. Further, this paper speaks to the collaboration of our Tribal Historic Preservation Office and its participation in the Advanced Metal Detecting for Archaeologists, or AMDA, workshop survey of the terrestrial portion of the Arnold's Bay Battlefield. Importantly, the project underscores how effective and meaningful consultation can move from review to collaboration with tribal communities. So despite James Fenimore Cooper's assertion in Last of the Mohicans, the contemporary Mohican tribe is very much alive. Uh, today, the nation is called the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Nation. The tribe is based in Wisconsin. However, the Stockbridge Muncie community's original homelands stretch the Hudson and Housatonic River Valleys. Their name, Hakini, <coughs> Mahikanek, meaning the people of the waters that are never still, refers to their origins along the rivers beginning at the southern base of Lake Champlain. For the tribe, they come from this land and had been here since time immemorial. What is known of Stockbridge Muncie community history comes from oral traditions, historical documents, and archaeological evidence. Documentation of their interaction and presence on the landscape here in the Northeast dates back to roughly 12,500 years ago. I'm not going to be able to cover, you know, in great depth, roughly 12,000 years of history, but I will attempt to convey a basic sense of what life may have looked like for ancestors throughout their homelands, throughout the Hudson Housatonic River Valleys, situated here on a modern map. These 12,000 years were not static. The geography and climate were through, <clears throat> went through great change. And with it, those ancestors shifted the way they approached life and how best to survive in the landscape. Population certainly started out small, restricted by the necessity of daily survival. Sites were punctuated by the seasonal nature of hunting and foraging. As climates and landscapes shifted to what we are uh, more familiar with today, so too did the understanding of cultivating and managing that land. The archeological record demonstrates areas being used by ancestors coming back to the same places year after year. In some cases, the archeological record tells us that sites were occupied for durations of hundreds, even thousands of years. For example, the significant Papskini Island just outside Albany, New York was occupied at points for nearly 4,000 years prior to Dutch contact. That's outstanding and requires a different approach to truly appreciate all those generations. 
So this map illustrates uh, an expansive system of communities, a thriving culture exemplified by village sites. These sites were interconnected, spreading news and goods amongst one another. As the archeological record indicates, sites connected distant regions through trade as exemplified by lithic materials found at Mohican sites in Addison County, Vermont. Those materials originally came from a location over a thousand miles away in present day Canada. Through federal and state consultation, as well as program programmatic research projects, our Tribal Historic Preservation Office helps document and understand more of this past world prior to European contact. That growing list, the ephemeral nature of what survives in the archaeological record, is a true de demonstration of the resilience of a people over thousands of years of continued occupation in an area. So contact with European colonial powers began in 1609, when the Dutch under Henry Hudson reached what is now New York State. At that time, Mohican power was consolidated in the capital region around present-day Albany. The seat of government, their council fire, was at Skodak Island. In a little more than 100 years, Mohicans were rapidly being pressured by European settler colonialism. Dependence on foreign cultural items, foreign ideas of property ownership, and foreign religious practices. This interaction was devastating for the Mohican people. The combination of lost land taken by right of discovery, indebtedness driven in part by trade goods and diseases, reduced Mohican territory and population significantly. In the early 1730s, Mohicans faced a decision to accept invitation by the colonial officials of Massachusetts. The Massachusetts legislature granted a township of six miles square to be laid out on the Housatonic River immediately north of Monument Mountain in 1735. The Housatonic River Valley was part of the traditional Mohican territory and included the village of Great Meadow. There, in 1736, English proprietors established Indian Town, a mission praying town that would later become the town of Stockbridge. It was a colonial experiment in joint governance between the Mohicans and English colonists living together in English fashion. So the experiment of Stockbridge was short-lived. Coming home from service in the Revolutionary War, tribal militiamen returned to find that their properties had been taken by colonists through lopsided land deals and all-out theft. With an invitation from the United and Western New York, Mohicans then called Stockbridge Indians, left the Berkshires. By 1784, within 50 years of the foundation of Indian Town, the meeting house had been raised to the ground, <clears throat> ending the experiment of joint governance. The tribe would then leave on their many trails of removal west over the next 150 years until where they would ultimately reach their current location in present-day Shawana County, Wisconsin. So with that overview, I want to turn now quickly to the Sockbridge Muncie Community Tribal Historic Preservation Office and discuss the work that we do. Our Historic Preservation Extension Office is based within the tribe's ancestral homelands in Williamstown, Massachusetts. We are under the Cultural Affairs Department, which interfaces on projects with the tribe's language, library, and museum programs based on the reservation in Wisconsin. The Historic Preservation Program is made up of two staff members. We consult on projects within the tribe's ancestral homelands throughout the Hudson River Valley and Housatonic River Valley. These homelands comprise six states. We also consult on projects in the areas in which the tribe spent time during their many removals west. That makes for many agencies that we work with and even more undertakings in which we review. So the Historic Preservation Office focuses on site protection and repatriation. We carry out these efforts under Federal Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and NACPRA. So my specific role within the program focuses on compliance review of federal and state undertakings. By undertaking, I mean any project that is federally funded, permitted, or licensed. There are, many, there are any number of projects. These range from pipelines, road enhancements, and housing developments. An agency has certain compliance obligations associated with cultural resources that may be present within a given project area. So our Tribal Historic Preservation Offices have the opportunity to review and comment on respective undertakings, making a determination on any impacts to historic properties. We conduct careful and meaningful government-to-government -government consultation with agencies on these projects. I also perform site visits and archaeological monitoring, develop mitigation strategies and avoidance measures through formal agreements, nominate properties to the National Register of Historic Places, and repatriate um, associated archaeological collections to be curated at our curation facility in Williamstown and or be sent to the Tribal Museum in Wisconsin. In these consultations, I'm a representative of the tribe and their pres preservation efforts. While these efforts are integral to site protection and cultural heritage in general, federal consultation, importantly, reaffirms the tribe as sovereign nation under law. 
So my colleague, uh, whom is uh, an enrolled tribal member, she focuses on NAGPRA and repatriation efforts. She works with federal and state and local institutions like museums, universities, or historical societies to bring back the remains of ancestors and other sacred objects culturally affiliated with the tribe. So let's go back now to the eve of the American Revolution. Uh, by the 1770s, you know, tensions were rising in Britain's 13 North American colonies, particularly Massachusetts. The Colonial Assembly, what would be known as the First Continental Congress, passed the Suffolk uh, Resolves in 1774. Among a number of resolutions, the Resolves formed the Massachusetts Provincial C Congress, subsequently requesting communities outside of British-controlled Boston to form and train militias in preparation for a potential conflict with Britain. Prominent leaders of the Stockbridge Muncie, located in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, met at the historic Red Lion Inn to discuss and form its own militia. Undoubtedly, the Stockbridge Muncie would have passionately discussed the benefits, if any, from participating in a standing militia and what that might mean for them in the future. Within months of the formation of the Stockbridge Militia, the first shots of the American Revolutionary War were fired at the Battle of Lexington. Armed conflict ensued over the next eight years, intertwining the lice of all in the fight for colonial independence from the British Empire. So the Stockbridge Militia, for its part, participated in a number of historic and decisive battles throughout the Revolutionary War. Soon after the battles of Lexington and Concord, local militias, including the Stockbridge Militia, laid siege against British-controlled Boston. The Stockbridge Militia had participated in, an, in the capture and surrender of the British garrison at Fort Ticonderoga in May of 1775. Later, they helped lay siege to British-controlled Boston, where on March 17, 1775, the British troops withdrew from Boston, surrendering to colonial forces. By 1777, the Stockbridge Militia had been reorganized and subsumed into the newly formed Continental Army under command of tribal leaders such as Daniel Ninham, where they went on to fight at the Battle of Bennington and Battle of Saratoga. Success by the Continental Army against British General John Burgoyne during the Saratoga campaign uh, largely concluded fighting in the Northern Theater for the remainder of the war. The Stockbridge Militia went on to see fighting at the Battles of Monmouth in New Jersey, and soon after, Stockbridge Militia troops were ambushed and massacred at a site in present-day Bronx, New York, what's now uh, Van Cortlandt Park. Stockbridge Militia under Daniel Ninham were surprised by tr British troops under Lieutenant Colonel John Simcoe. The militia suffered great loss of tribal leaders and members during the skirmish and massacre. So in 2020, the Stockbridge Muncie Community Tribal Historic Preservation Office was contacted by the National Park Service's American Battlefield Protection Program and the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum to initiate review of the Section 106 undertaking. The proposed undertaking was located in Addison County, Vermont, a location within the tribe's areas of interest in which we consult. My official introduction to the project was a tribal, as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer reviewing the proposed Arnold's Bay project to make a determination of effect to possible cultural resources within the project area that may be impacted by the respective undertaking. So after careful consultation with the LCMM staff, both Cher and Chris, um, <clears throat> we discussed the project scope and review of the proposed project documents. It was determined that there was going to be no significant threat to cultural resources within the APE. So all too often, Native American participation in the Revolutionary War is relegated to footnotes and are often homogenized. So in this case, tribal members serving within the Stockbridge Melissa served at the Battle of Velcro Bay. They fought under the command of General David Waterbury on the vessel to Washington during the battle. The project served as an opportunity to bring recognition to the participation of the Stockbridge Militia in conflicts of the Revolutionary War nearly 250 years ago. So while there was no real concern with the proposed LCMM undertaking from, a, uh, from the TIPO's perspective, we asked to be involved in educational treatments that may highlight the tribal nation's participation in the conflict. LCMM agreed and further invited SMC TIPO, along with interested members of the tribal community, to participate in the battlefield survey associated with the terrestrial portion of Arnold's Bay project that was going to be carried out as an advanced metal detecting for archaeologists, the AMDA workshop, which is an RPA certified training course. So the three-day workshop allowed for real learning outcomes for all those involved. So in early October 2021, SMC TIPO staff participated in the LCMM and AMDA battlefield survey carried out near present-day Vergennes, Vermont. 
The workshop component of the Arnold Spay project included both classroom and practical training components, both aspects valuable to continued learning in archaeological field methodologies. The course room component focused on case studies where metal detecting methodologies have been employed on <clears throat> not only sites of conflict, but both pre-contact and historic period sites. Further, demonstrations included the functions of different metal detectors and strategies to consider when designing a field of study. The following days focus on conducting the survey in the field within the identified APE. Transects had been previously laid out and participants paired into groups with those that had previous metal detecting experience went out into the field. And I'll let LCMM and AMDA really focus on the actual methodologies employed, but in terms of experiential learning, it was immensely beneficial to understand how these types of projects are designed and carried out from the planning stage to the field. This is a real opportunity as an archaeologist to continue to develop their skill set. So most importantly, I think from the tribe's perspective and the perspective of the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, you know, the tribal nation is proud of its service members and their involvement in armed conflicts, both historically and contemporaneously, domestically and abroad. So this project gave an opportunity for representatives of the tribal nation to participate in the proposed battlefield survey to better understand the events at Arnold's Bay in which militia members participated in. So in moving the Section 106 review in consultation with our Tribal Historic Preservation Office to collaboration, having tribal representatives participate in the battlefield survey, you know, the past with the present was connected over nearly 250 years. That's powerful. We don't often have that opportunity to have such outcomes with all the projects that we review. So in participating in the Arnold's Bay project, SMC TIPA was able to continue our work effectively in maintaining the tribe's cultural heritage. And here's just several images I included of being out in the field. On the left, there's um, a canister shot that um, that we pulled out, uh, my team. Um, we pulled out several of those and a number of other um, metallic objects of interest. Um, and then over on the opposite, the right-hand side, um, Cher, I'm sure she's going to share some of these different objects with you, but she had brought some of them out and we're showing uh, participants of the workshop uh, some of the artifacts that had already been recovered. Um, and I was able to hold a British six pounder there. Um, and you could say, I have my mask on, but you can tell I'm smiling under my mask. So I got had the chance to nerd out a little bit. So I just want to thank, uh, thank you all for listening and thank the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum's meaningful consultation on this project and for inviting me to participate in it, uh, as well as um, tribal community members. I also want to thank you all for joining today uh, and listening to the presentation. So thank you. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, Nathan was not able to join us live for today's conference. Um, but before we move on, Chris, is there anything you would like to um, touch on before uh, about your interactions with Nathan as far as this project? No, um, you know, I think I think I summed it up kind of at the beginning there as well as I could that just the involvement of as many viewpoints um, and, and different expertise um, in this project as possible has really brings a new depth of understanding to these events. Um, you know, we are certainly proponents of the idea that archaeology can help to verify, refute, or refine our understanding of the past um, through the location of its material remains um, and bringing in as many viewpoints to analyze and assess and understand those material remains as possible um, really it allows the, the, the fullest understanding of those events to emerge um, through that continued research. So I've found our consultation uh, with Nathan and the other uh, Native American community members who are involved in this project to be enormously valuable and uh, a, a wonderful addition to the process, so. Excellent, no, thank you so much. And I'm so glad we were able to uh, share his presentation as part of today's conference. Absolutely. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll move on to our final uh, presenter today, and then we'll uh, move on to our final Q&A section uh, after that. So thank you, Chris. Fantastic. Our final presentation today is being presented by Sherilyn Gilligan. Sherilyn is the uh, uh, 
assistant archaeological director at the Maritime Museum and um, a longtime colleague of mine who I've had the pleasure of working with for, gosh, I think it's been nearly a decade now. Um, Sharer is going to share with us some information about what we found, uh, both in water and on land, and give us some more information on uh, how the, those items are accomplishing those goals that I mentioned before of refining, refuting, um, or reaffirming our understanding of the past and historic documentation. So take it away, Sharer. Thanks so much, Chris, uh, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. All right, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Hopefully I can do this right. <laughs> so I think this is the one that I want. All right. Can someone let me know if th I've done this right, please? <laughs> Hello? Anyone out there? Looks good, Chair. Right. Go for Can you it. See? Yeah. Okay, yep. great. <laughs> so I'm presenting uh, some data on the material culture that has come uh, from the Arnold's Bay site. So I'll start with the underwater transects and uh, you know talk about a bit about what was found and some preliminary interpretations. And then I'm going to combine those findings with the terrestrial survey that was conducted in partnership with the Advanced Metal Detecting for the Archaeologist Group. Uh, again, I'll go over what was found in those survey areas, um, as well as some preliminary interpretations. And then I want to touch on some material culture that has found its way into our museum's collections over the years, as well as some objects that are scattered throughout the area in other museums and other collections, and what that kind of material culture can add to our overall understanding of the site. Okay. So Ed Scollin went over more of the logistics and reasoning for placing our transects where we did. So I'm just showing you here another view of those transects in proximity to where we know the Congress remains begin on the map on the right here. Sure. Again, we've not, ex yes? I'm sorry to interrupt, but what we're seeing right now is your PowerPoint screen. We're not seeing the presentation. Oh, that's unfortunate. All right, let me figure this out. It's showing on my screen, so. Okay. Did that fix it? Try try sharing one more time and see if you... Okay. Hold on one second. Sorry. I knew I was going to mess this up. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Um, it should... Hmm. Sure, I think if you share your screen just like you did the first time and then just hit start slideshow, you should be good to go. That's what I did. <laughs> Hold on, I'm sorry, folks. Oh. Is this working now? Can we see the presentation in its full? Perfect. That's good. Okay. Good to go. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that, uh, and thanks for letting me know before I got too far. Okay, so here we go. We've not explored the Congress yet. This is where I left off, uh, but we do have a permit into the Naval Heritage and History Command to be able to access this site, hopefully this season. Um, and then here on the left, you can get a feel for what the transects looked like underwater before we started stirring up too much sediment. All right, so. The underwater survey last year produced 95 artifacts, and you can see these broken down into categories here on the left-hand side of this chart. Uh, you can quickly tell the majority of the collection is made up of diagnostic nails. Um, we've got a section of modern or unidentifiable materials. We had a single piece categorized as apparel, which is a brass shoe buckle that I'll show in a bit. Um, and then we have this second largest section here of ammunitions. And to the right, you can see how that section breaks down into types majority of which were musket balls. We found 24 musket balls, six pieces of case shot, and one six pound cannonball. And I've put these melt, uh, pieces of melted lead in here as well. And I'll explain the context for those in a few more slides. Okay, on the bottom left here, you can see that uh, first pie chart again, showing the artifacts by category. So we're starting with the big orange section of nails. Uh, and we have a nice visual on the right here where diagnostic nails were found along transect one and transect two. And you can see a big gap on transect two on the right hand side, starting about the halfway point. And we didn't find nails again until almost the southern point. So this is a reminder uh, that negative data can be just as informative as finding material culture across a site. 
Um, and as we continue to crunch more of the data that we've gathered, we'll be able to get more granular information on the types of nails found. So whether these count as larger spikes or smaller nails, which would have been used in different parts of a boat's construction. So that's something that we uh, still want to analyze moving forward. And in this image, uh, we're seeing the scatter of case shot across the site. All six pieces of case shot were found along transect two on the right hand side. You can see these are all clustered at the north end of that transect, closer to where the remains of Congress were located. And then on transect one on the left uh, to the south end, you can see the location of the six pound cannonball. Um, and there's a picture of Ed bringing that piece up to the boat in the bottom left there. This was a very exciting day in the field for us. Okay, now we're seeing the scatter of musket balls across the two transects, which is more of an even spread with maybe more of a cluster uh, near the center of transect two again. Um, and then here we have a, our reference pie chart uh, reminding us there were 24 musket balls found along the two transects in total. And then above you can see a size comparison of two pieces. Um, we're still in the process of analyzing all of the musket balls from the site. Uh, using some excellent resources produced in part by uh, Joel Bowie and some of our other friends at AMDA. So general note on sizing here, we should be able to pick out British ammunition from American, British shot typically being larger. But again, we have a lot more work to do before we'll have that full analysis. Okay, and then we found these uh, four pieces of melted lead, several of which had this really distinct reformed shape that almost looks like it ran between floorboards and reformed there. And it may be hard to make out from these images uh, on the front and back of one of these objects here at the top of the slide, but what this material could represent is melted shot from the floor of one of the burning vessels. And we're finding those bits of melted lead again centered along transect one. And I'll mention here, uh, that single piece of apparel was this boot buckle on the bottom left here. And on the map on the right, you can see that location is in the same artifact uh, cluster marked in yellow. Okay, so here's our very messy transects with all of the material that we've found showing. And if you remember uh, that earlier, that yellow section is where we've located some of the articulated remains of Congress. So we're playing around with our data here. We're trying to figure out based on the material culture that we've found, where the location of some of these boats were when they burned. And we remember from section or transect two on the right-hand side, that big cluster of most materials is at that center point. Most of the case shot there was towards the end of transect two, um, the north end of transect two rather, and the melted lead and personal apparel, again, clustered in the center of that transect. So you can see uh, the red outline as a possibility for the location of one of the burning gunboats. And there above that, uh, the red outline potentially of Congress, that larger row galley blocking and protecting the smaller boats while men were jumping overboard to try to get into shore. Again, preliminary ideas, but it's interesting to play around with different scenarios and compare what we're seeing to what we found in primary accounts and what we have physically found at the site. And of course, think about what we need to test this year now that we have this data. Um, and this image on the left, uh, which we saw in a few other presentations by now, again, this is that painting by Colonel Waterhouse, which shows an interpretation of Arnold's soldiers under fire from the British ships at Arnold's Bay. All right, so zooming out, you can see our underwater cluster again for reference. Check out the mouth of the bay here. Um, so we know the British ships uh, were probably too large to even enter the bay, and we have reference to the two sides firing back and forth at each other. So we decided to test uh, this shoreline area or that transitional zone where the bluff runs down to the beach, and that's outlined in yellow here. And then you can see the areas we chose to sample in the agricultural field up on the bluff outlined in the pink sections. Um, the actual class really focused on the easternmost shoreline or transitional zone, if you think about people jumping off of beach boats and running to shore under fire, that eastern shore is going to be your quickest route of escape. So we also tested the areas behind that um, in the field to show, you know, maybe we're going to catch some of that field of fire from the British ships. Um, and then as well, uh, behind the Ferris homestead, we wanted to test that area again, checking field of fire against primary sources and previous archaeology. And then on the left, you can see our stellar AMDA class who did all of this grunt work, uh, metal detecting these areas, collecting the material and documenting those objects in the field. Um, this picture was taken right at the curve in the field where you can see the two pink boxes stacked. This whole section turned out to be uh, cut and fill, unfortunately. But again, now we know that about the landscape, this was a necessary 
uh, part to find out. All right. So we're still uh, zoomed out and you can see the highest concentrations of artifacts across the area that we tested. So this map shows all of the GPS points we took, uh, including boundary markers and uncatalogued objects. So there's a lot of noise on this image, but again, it just uh, shows us where those largest concentrations are. And as we zoom into different areas, I'm going to try and pull out some of that noise and focus in on the diagnostic artifacts. So to start off, this survey produced over 260 objects. Uh, we collected a bit more than that to have kind of uh, the samples of modern garbage that we found in different areas. Um, and we collected bits as well that we couldn't immediately identify. Um, so for the next data sets that I'll be showing, I'm working with about half of the total objects that were collected. So working with 123 objects in total for the next data sets. And again, um, this area on that southeastern side of the bay where it starts to curve determined to be cut and fill. So you can really see we did, really didn't collect very much from that area. Um, and I'm going to focus in on that busy area of the shoreline just east of the underwater transects in just a minute. Um, to give you a general breakdown of artifacts by category for the terrestrial survey, I've got another um, pie and pie chart here. I'm lumping this the data into only three categories this time. Males and agricultural related objects, obviously the largest category, then ammunition, um, ammunitions, excuse me, followed by apparel. And I will say here that I'm just going to focus on ammunitions and apparel today. In the future, we're going to look at the exciting minutia of nails. But for that study, we really need to separate out the data by location. I would be more interested to see diagnostic nails along the transitional zone of the shoreline, which could be uh, related to the vessels that were removed and displayed on shore historically. So this chart uh, includes all locations of this material. And then on the right side, you can see the majority of ammunitions again, our musket balls. Uh, we're seeing two sizes again, just as we did underwater. Same for the case shot that was found. Uh, we also located a few pieces of buckshot, the super small pieces. Um, so kudos to the metal detectors who found those. And finally, a lead jaws pad or a flint wrapper was found, which we'll see again shortly. And then we've got our breakdown of that apparel section here on the right. That's the same artifacts by category on the left. So we had seven pieces of apparel. Again, I'll mention that as we go through and refine our data, these figures are gonna change around a bit. Um, you can see I threw one of our mystery objects in here, but th presently that's an unidentified piece. So under apparel, we've found some buttons, a few buckles, a really nice example of a bayonet scabbard hook, and then that mystery object. And we'll have a look at all of these shortly. So starting with the shoreline or a transitional zone, we tried to get the best coverage that we could following the contour of the waterline up to where there's a sharp incline up to the bluff. Um, lake water level levels are typically lower in fall. So we were lucky in a way that field work got pushed back uh, from spring to fall because we were able to cover a lot more of that transitional zone that's generally underwater for most of the year. And I know this uh, map is still pretty busy, but this one is color coded. So the ubiquitous yellow in both the field and shoreline areas are nails. The red units are ammunitions. There's that pie chart showing us our ammunitions breakdown again. The darker red points along the eastern shoreline are musket balls and the lighter ones are case shot. And I put some images showing the size differences for some of those ammunitions on the left-hand side here. Uh, the middle one are examples of iron case shot, and the bottom photos show the buckshot followed by uh, one small and one larger example of the lead musket balls that we found. And uh, now these categories of ammunitions that we found on the shoreline area, these would have been underwater in the spring. Um, and we also know that this area has been picked over before, not only historically, uh, but recently by trespassers as well. So being able to gather the data along the transitional zone here while it was so shallow was really important to this study overall. And uh, on the top left here, you can see that lead jaws pad or a flint wrapper. Um, and then the green units on this map are the apparel, which we're going to look at next. All right, pie chart here reminding us how the apparel broke down. Uh, we had a few buttons, one in the field on the right, one along the shoreline, and one more behind the homestead. And you can see one of those examples in the first image at the top here. We found two buckle fragments along the beach. Uh, there's one example in that image underneath the button. And then the bottom two images, we have the top and side view of that bayonet scabbard hook from the transitional zone. And now we'll head over to the homestead and check out this area. 
So this was the last survey area for the AMDA class. Uh, this section was located in the field behind the Ferris homestead, where we found a handful of diagnostic nails, again, those yellow markers, um, ammunitions as well. There were uh, three pieces of case shot back here in the bright red. Uh, the darker red was a musket ball. And then those two pieces in green are marked as apparel. One was a button and the other was this mystery object. Again, preliminary interpretation that I threw this into apparel. Uh, we really aren't sure what this object is yet, but it's pretty interesting. Uh, it appears cupreous. It has a, like a green patina on parts. It's pretty heavy. Uh, it's pretty deep red. Um, so these are uh, both sides of that interesting piece. And then uh, the last thing that I wanted to touch on today was some of the material culture from the site that has made its way to our museum and other museums and historical societies around the area over the years. Um, we know that so much has happened to this site since the time of deposition. People have been removing objects from the site, starting with the British salvage efforts right after the battle, to local relic hunters who took timbers to make souvenirs with, to excavations in the 50s, 60s, and 80s. Um, so objects from this site are scattered all around the region in different museums and historical societies, but also in private collections. And something the museum has always tried to do is make lasting connections with our local communities and some of the people who have these objects so that we can learn about them and share that knowledge with the public. And with all of our post-depositional research that we've done and that we continue to do, um, another goal of this project is to pull all of that information together. So consolidate the knowledge that we've collected and make that information more accessible to people. So here's some highlighted bits that I'll end with. Um, and I know that uh, Chris showcased this piece as well, but it's a really cool story. Uh, and I definitely recommend people look up some old newspaper accounts of it because um, it's pretty cool to read about. But this is a cannon that was found at the mouth of Arnold's Bay in the 1930s uh, by Paul Bill Huber. And this piece sat on his lawn. This is a picture of it from his lawn from a newspaper article. Uh, and it eventually found its way to the museum and was conserved here. Uh, again, currently on display in the Key to Liberty building on campus. And there I am standing with that exhibit. And here you can see an image of Congress at the center uh, that was pulled on shore in the 1890s with the old sail ferry behind it. And below that, you can see some pretty big bolts uh, that came from this wreck and were eventually gifted to the museum. I believe from the Haglund family. Chris, you can correct me later if I'm wrong. Um, on the far left, this is Henry Sheldon's memorial chair uh, made in 1884. The third spindle from the left on the bottom row is from Congress. Um, and this piece, of course, at the Henry Sheldon Museum in Middlebury. Very cool piece to learn about. And then on the far right, uh, you can see a plank and a cane from the Vermont Historical Society. The cane is said to be wood from the keel of Congress and the plank as well from Congress. And we have a lot of other uh, items in the museum's collection, uh, like these single souvenir objects like these. And so do many other museums around the region. I know uh, Clinton County Historical Association in Peru, Plattsburgh area um, in New York has objects like these as well. Uh, they may be wood from the Royal Savage, which sank at Valcor. So these kinds of pieces are all around. So uh, definitely go check out uh, Clinton County Historical Association as well. And then this is a really uh, special piece. So last year, a local family donated to us two windows from the Rogue Alley Congress, one of which includes the glass pane here, which is about an inch thick. Um, the second example is the frame only. And these are really exciting pieces for a number of reasons. One is that we can see some construction techniques for the window. There are no surviving Rogue Alley vessels from this time period, so we really don't know much about the overall construction of this vessel class. So it's really cool to see the tiny wooden pegs at the corners here. And secondly, how cool is it that we can look through a window of a flagship from the Revolutionary War? Um, it's a really powerful feeling to look through the same window that historical figures looked through during such terrible events of war. And you can imagine what things would have looked like through this really unique glass. Um, it's a very cool piece. And then here, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh, it's working. Um, this past summer, we had a very talented photogrammetry intern join us from ECU, uh, Taylor Picard. And they produced some really excellent 3D models of some pieces from our collections. And from their work, we now have these 3D models from Timbers of Congress. Uh, these are two stern floors. Um, well, this is one example. And uh, these were gifted to the museum by the Haglund family again. Um, and again, Lorenzo Haglund was the man who raised Philadelphia from Lake Champlain in the 1930s. And he also pulled the last gunboat from the bay in the 1950s. And we have some actual photographs of uh, 
of that event in our collection, which I think were showcased by maybe Ed earlier or Chris. Um, so at one time or another, they procured these bits too. And we now have these awesome bits, um, not only the <laughs> actual pieces, but the 3D models of these now. And you can see these and other models produced by Taylor Picard and Chris Sabic, and hopefully soon by me, up on this uh, site, sketchfab.com. So you can go to sketchfab.com, you can look up the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum and check out some of these models and a bunch more. So I highly recommend folks check that out. And thank you again to uh, Taylor Picard for all the models that you made for us while you were here. And so with each of these objects, uh, we're learning little bits about the boats from this fleet. We're learning a little bit more about the events that took place on the day of this battle. And we're learning a little bit about what happened to the site later on. So we're gaining this greater understanding of the overall picture. Uh, we're bringing in as many voices as we can. And you know, we're looking at this overall site that we're working with. Um, and we've got a bit more time left on the project. Uh, so we're gonna keep at it and uh, give folks more to look forward to this following field season. We can't wait to share more about the project soon. So stay tuned to the museum for updates. We will continue to update our website and other social media with more from the Arnold's Bay project. Um, thanks again from all of us presenting today. Uh, oh, let's see if my video will go. Yay, <laughs> this is our goofy dive team here. Uh, we should be jumping back in the water probably as soon as the ice melts. So more from us soon. And again, uh, thanks to the American Battlefield Protection Program for funding this project, to our collaborators, the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans and Abenaki leaders and members. And finally, to our friends at AMDA for having a class up here with us. And also to our preliminary survey team for that class, uh, Casey Campetti, Craig Allen, Joel Bowie, Taylor Picard and Dennis Hopper. So thanks so much. Let's see if I can uh, stop sharing properly. <laughs> Um, okay. Did that work? <laughs> Excellent. You did great, Cher. <laughs> well <Hi>. done. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Um, and uh, we can, so we can invite back um, all our panelists um, for our final Q&A session. Um, and we will do our best to get through as many of your questions as we possibly can in our time remaining. But um, Thank you all again for such great presentations today. It was uh, wonderful to hear all your different perspectives and um, get to hear more about this project. Thank you. Excellent. All right, so to start us off, um, this is, a, I feel like, a good pickup point from Cher where you left off. Um, what types of artifacts does your permit allow you to remove for further research, and how do you determine what gets removed as obvious trash, and what might a historic artifact from a different era that needs to stay put? Oh, that's a lot. I almost want to bring it up so I can reread it. Um, is it in the Q&A section here? It is. Mm -hmm. How about we can start off with uh, yeah. what types of artifacts do you get or does your permit allow you to remove? Um, so the permit gives us permission to access the archaeological site. So we're for the surveys, we're collecting all the metal that we're finding. Um, and whether or not we can determine immediately what those are, uh, we've saved everything. <laughs> and we've also saved some obvious tra trash examples too. Uh, you kind of need to keep that in mind too, just in general for archeology. span um, I don't know, does anyone else want to jump in with a little more answer to that? I mean, obviously we're not touching the uh, Congress remains yet. The material is under permit from the Navy. So, you know, our permit application is in and we're hopefully going to hear from them soon. Uh, but for the state land and for the private land, which is, I guess, under that same permit in a way, um, we're collecting all of the metal that was found. Yeah, I think that that is a pretty comprehensive answer is that we're, we're recovering everything that we locate. Um, and then it will be during the process of analysis and conservation of those artifacts that we determine, you know, what represents modern trash, so to speak. And, um, and that will be disposed of uh, the, the remaining items will be curated uh, moving forward. Yeah, I guess I can add to that. Um, everything that we've found, I've cataloged and photographed uh, pre-treatment of. So we do have documentation of that material. Um, and we also, um, you know, like Chris said, uh, we will make a determination on what will be kept. Sometimes when you're conserving things, they fall apart. <laughs> so that's just a reality of the situation too. And then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll make that call on, on what's not kept at a later time. Excellent. <laughs> that was great. 
Awesome. Um, Ed, I know you um, touched on this a little bit um, in your Q&A session with Chris um, about erosion in the area, um, but would you expect ammunition to still be embedded in the bluff um, or has there been enough erosion for it to mostly be on the beach? I think there's still going to be some on the beach. Um, and as Cher pointed out, um, a lot of that's cut and fill area too. So I think there's a lot of area there that's actually had fill put on top of it and stone to prevent the erosion. So I don't know that we're ever going to be able to really access um, all of what was left there. We are also aware of actually some of the sailors actually being buried on site there too. Uh, so it's quite possible. Uh, that's what the survey is all about, is really to find out what's there. And uh, right now we really don't know. We won't know until we look. Absolutely. Nice. Uh, another one of our questions was, um, was or is there any evidence of Native American activity at Arnold's Bay? Um, I don't know who wants to take that one. But. Well, we do have reference to, um, I think it was part of the Ferris Homestead collection that there had been location of, um, I think it was Otter Creek points there. Um, I've only found reference to these in notation. I haven't seen these in the collection. Uh, that doesn't mean that they aren't somewhere else. <laughs> um, it's just like, you know, the nature of and detective work of tracking down so much material culture that has come from this site. Um, we did not locate anything during our metal detection. Um, you know, but there are archaeological, like Native American sites around this area. So, you know, we're definitely going to touch on you know, through time, what, how this land was used. Um, you know, th it's an attractive bay. I mean, it's insane to think that people wouldn't have been there since people were there. So <laughs> hopefully that touches on most of that question. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Um, I know we uh, touched base, uh, I think this is going back to Chris's original presentation. Um, but why was the ballast piled up in that way? Um, from previous excavation, is it likely an artifact concentration there? Yeah, that is uh, something I, I touched on briefly during my presentation. And there are two distinct uh, piles of ballast. Um, and just to you know, come full circle here and describe, some people may not be aware of what ballast is, but in many cases, sailing ships would load the lower portion of the hull with um, with stone or in some cases heavy metal objects in order to balance the ship and to keep it more stable when it's sailing and healing over to one side uh, in the wind. Uh, just making it a much more stable platform both for sailing and for uh, use of the guns uh, on the vessel. Um, but the, the current location on the bottom of the bay is there because of uh, previous recovery efforts at the site. So the pile that is off uh, the stern or the back end of the vessel um, is probably there from when um, the Adams family grabbed on to the back of the stern of the Congress in 1891 and yanked it out. Um, and you can imagine if there was stone evenly across the bottom of this hall as they lifted that bottom portion out and pulled it, that that would get dumped forward and be deposited into a pile there, which I had the model of in my presentation. The other ballast pile of ballast that's off to what we presume is the, star, uh, the port side, the left-hand side of the forward half of the Congress remains was placed there during the excavations in, 19, in 1960 and 61, I believe, uh, by the Lake Champlain Archaeological Association, um, who very clearly state that they uh, removed those stones and put them you know, just beyond the extant timbers. So they just, and, and that's their pile just outside of where these little frame tips are sticking up from out of the mud. Uh, the interior of the hall has since refilled with mud but those stones have remained uh, just outside of the timbers. Um, wonderful. Well, and um, one of our other questions we have is, uh, what other non-metal artifacts have you found or would expect to find eventually uh, as part of the survey? That's a good question. I know we found some bits of leather uh, here and there. 
um, we picked, uh, I think we kept some uh, ceramic that was in the cut and fill just to be able to date that because there was a maker's mark. Um, I don't know, can you guys think of anything else? It was like obvious stuff that was, you know, on the, on the surface or like large enough to see. It's, it's not like we were screening anything. Um, sure. Yeah, I think that's, you know, um, since we have based this, at least this portion of our research on metal detecting, um obviously that's the sam that that's the sample method we're using that's what we're going to find is is most of the metal stuff and i see there's another question here about uh the potentially missing uh, of human remains and that's absolutely true metal detecting is not going to um locate those items unless they have metal artifacts associated with the burial or with the remains which is not impossible in, in, by any stretch of the imagination um, that said, if we are able to obtain our permit for the excavation of the Congress remains, um, even though many of the artifacts were recovered in, in the 1960s, undoubtedly we will be finding bits and pieces um, amongst the, the lower hall timbers. And that could include ceramics, glass, um, leather, and other organic materials like bone fragments, uh, both of you know, potentially human remains. It's not something that we uh, are expecting to find, but it's, it's certainly not an impossibility, but probably evidence of foodstuffs and things that they were eating on board the boats. Um, so in that instance, we could find just about anything you can imagine from an archeological site. And that's the stuff we're honestly quite excited to find. Uh, but with our methodologies that we used in 2021, they were focused on metal detecting as a sampling technique. Uh, and uh, Joel could probably give some good good in, uh, input on. Uh, yeah, what else do you guys question. keep, Joel? <laughs> I wanna hear more about that. <laughs> well, what do we keep um, from the projects? Or what I, do you find, you know? Oh God, I mean, we find pretty much, you know, it depends on the site. Obviously, Gettysburg is going to be different and have a lot more material um, than a Revolutionary War site for the most part. Um, but, you know, we're on these projects, these Rev War projects, we're finding a lot of the same things that we found um, at Arnold's Bay. Um, you know, musket balls, the flint wrappers, um, cannonballs, case shot, um, what you're calling apparel you know, buttons and, and things like that, regimental coat buttons. So, you know, it's kind of what I expected to find. And actually, to be honest with you, I thought there was a lot less trash um, there than there would be. So I was kind of impressed with that. That's cool. That's cool. Do you guys ever keep other uh, non-metal stuff that you yeah. magically find in with the... <laughs> Especially uh, when we're working on a National Park Service site, um, they save um, all of that material and take it back to the lab and go through it, um, you know, unless it's a beer can slaw or something like that, which we do find quite a bit of. Uh, yeah. But normally those things get saved and go back to the lab to be verified. A, a great example of how a metal detecting can lead to other types of materials actually comes uh, from the Valcor Bay Research Project that Ed discussed in such detail. You know, we got a great metal detector hit and excavated an ammunition box. And it was obviously the lead shot in the ammunition box that set off the metal detector, but that allowed us to discover the wooden block from the ammunition pouch, the leather flap that covered it, and the buckle that um, would have been on the strap of the ammunition box. So in some cases, metal detecting does lead to finding other types of materials that it would normally pick up if they were isolated by themselves. I wasn't going to bring up the cartridge box um, because Ed and I were talking about it, you know, texting back and forth about this because we were like, damn, why didn't we put together all the research on the, on the cartridge box? Because it is a super cool find that you found metal detecting that, yeah, you found the shot that came out of it. But there's a lot of documentation I have on that 19 hole um, box. And um, I think down the road, Ed and I may put something together on that for one of the next uh, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum presentations. Great, yeah, you know, this was this was really one of the more remarkable finds of that Valcor Bay project, because not only did it include the shot and the box itself, but there was flints involved as well, both used flints oh. and fresh flints. It was really, uh, really a, an interesting find. So we may encounter things of that nature in this uh, process as well at Arnold's Bay. 
Nice. Well, we do have a question um, somewhat, uh, that was asked um, regarding metals. There don't seem to be any tools from the ships found underwater, such as cannon warmers, rammers, ladles, and scrapers, um, which should have been a lot on the vessels. Are these objects likely to have picked up by treasure hunters? We have a lot of those objects in the Liege collection, don't we, Chris? Um, yeah, th this is that a, a, excavation from the 60s. Go ahead. Yeah, th this is a great example of how these kind of other collections that have come out of Arnold's Bay um, in the past are helping to inform our discussion now. So from the excavations that were done of the Congress Hall in the 1960s, there are a number of tools, including, a, I think, a caulking iron, um, a yeah. big um auger which is would have been used to to drill holes like, that would accommodate the giant bolts like Cher showed in her presentation uh and another a, a couple of other tools of that nature the specific cannon um equipment like the wormer and scoop and and things of that nature we certainly could find them um, oh, we did. and and at at valcor uh a powder later was discovered dragon Greg DeRocher and Dennis O'Neill actually found uh, oh. powder. Um, it was actually on one of the slides that I included in my presentation. Yeah. So that, that photograph might be available at another time. Incredible piece. Of yeah, powder. very cool. The other thing to keep in mind is that equipment was probably um, on deck, uh, you know, near the guns themselves, and therefore may have either been recovered by the British when they came in and grabbed the guns or it might have burned uh, more extensively and, and been recovered later. Who knows? We may still come across it, but we haven't found any of that stuff yet. Excellent. Um, one of our other questions, um, sort of on the topic of ammunition, ammunition, ammunition. Excuse me. Um, is there any way to tell um, whether it has been fired um, during the conflict or just uh, was on stored on the boat as they burned? That's a great Joel question. <laughs> Looking at you, Joel. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there are ways to tell. Um, a lot of times when you fire a musket ball out of a smoothbore musket, um, you can find the ball and think it's a dropped or unfired ball. But when you look at it um, under magnification, you can see a thing called banding, where it hits the side of the, uh, the barrel and scrapes on the way out. And sometimes you can see uh, powder burn stipling on the on the base of the ball so even that's why we check all of the stuff before we catalog it as unfired or dropped um, because you can um, you can tell the difference between fired and dropped and, and obviously there's a lot of fired musket balls that we find um, with deformation uh, deformed ball and we have a scale that we put together from one to three um, where we look at the ball and when we catalog it we catalog the deformation as well or no deformation if it's a dropped or unfired ball. And this is what I was talking about with, uh, we are nowhere near done with that analysis of this stuff. We're using all of Joel's references for this stuff. And uh, he's really done some incredible experimental archeology span stuff that's just so interesting. Um, so yeah, we're excited to, to dig into that. <laughs> I'm excited to, to see the data from that too. Oh yeah, absolutely. We did find drops at Belcor also. Uh, Craig and I were working in an area um, and we came into these piles of uh, musket balls. There'd be 17 in a little pile. We found three of them all within, a, within an area of one another. And what we think it probably are is they were all together as a cartridge and actually we fired out of a swivel gun. And these were things that, you know, the, the men had dropped during the heat of battle and the cartridge is gone, but the, the shot is still there. So it's, it's pretty cool because it also shows you right where that boat was at the time. So it was a way that we could determine, you know, station of one of the ships. Um, we have a great question um, referring back to the 3D model that was in Cher's presentation. Um, was this fabricated from one piece of wood and do you know what kind of wood was used? Uh, that's a good Chris question, I feel like. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's sure. more Sorry, Cher. Um, I'll, I'll try. Um, yes, that is that is a single piece of wood. Um, what you're looking at there um, uh, is a floor, which is uh, the, the portion of a frame or a rib of a boat. And that the floor is the part that actually crosses the center line and extends to either side of it. Um, it is, so it is a single piece of wood that would have been bolted 
with a large iron pin, like Cher showed in her presentation, that it went through the keelson, which is a longitudinal timber that sat on top of that floor. The bolt went through the keelson, through the floor, and through and down into the keel. So it kind of locked them all into one piece. Um, what type of wood it is, that's a really great question and something that we'll have to look into some more. Um, you know, typical, I, we haven't done a wood typology on this specific frame yet, but it's something that we would uh, like to do in the future and that we will certainly do of the other timbers from the Congress when we have the opportunity to excavate them. Um, it is in all likelihood a piece of oak. Um, that was the typical process uh, or ship shipbuilding timber selection um, in the 18th century was to build the kind of the, the backbone and the, the structural timbers of a vessel out of oak. And then the planking might be of uh, another material like pine or uh, secondary material. If you have an opportunity to look at that three-dimensional model closely, you'll see it's really not a great piece of wood. Uh, there's a lot of knots. It's got some weird bends to it. And the model of the other frame from Congress that we have is also on Sketchfab. It's even worse. It's got this funny little bend to it. And um, I think that's evidence of the fact that they were building these boats with whatever timber they had available and as quickly as possible, um, which is something that is evidenced in a lot of these are uh, artifacts from both Valcor Bay and, uh, uh, and, and the stuff that's come out of Arnold's Bay. This was very early in the war effort and things were done quickly. And, um, you know, they weren't building these boats for them to last 30 years. They just needed to last one campaign season. So they threw together uh, the vessels as quickly as they could with whatever material they had at hand. Um, I know all of you have talked a little bit about um, some of the permits you've needed to do, be able to do your research um, in Arnold's Bay. Um, we have a question of, didn't the people who removed the ships originally from the bay need past permits when they did that? I was just messaging them privately. That's a great <laughs> question. Um, yeah. So the National Historic Preservation Act went into effect in 1966. So that offered more protection to archaeological sites that were, you know, at, at that time, there was a big uptick in people picking over these like really important archaeological sites across the country um, and in other places in the world too. So, you know, that law, that's like section 106, uh, you know, cultural resource management law that uh, Nathan Allison went into a little bit further on. Um, that stuff, I think, came like even a little bit later, like in regulations. So, you know, that was like the first step uh, to putting in place some of the protections that we have today for some of these archaeological sites. So it's a great question. And I love when people ask about the context of that stuff. Um, so now, yes, you need all these permits and you need these per permissions uh, to protect these sites so that we can still learn about them. Like, think of how much we're learning from just like these <laughs> pieces that we're digging out of like agricultural fields, you know? So um, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, and, and even to, to add on to, to Cher's description there, the, the Abandoned Shipwreck Act wasn't uh, put into place until the 1980s, which really, uh, you know, brought the protection of shipwrecks that were still in the water uh, even more into focus. And it was that uh, piece of legislation that really um, basically made the, the management of shipwrecks the responsibility of the state whose waters they are sunk in. So stuff that's sunk in Vermont is the, you know, is the, the uh, under the permitting purview of Vermont and the same with New York and all the other states, except in the case of military vessels who they belong the, to, continue to belong to the government whose flag they were flying at the time they sank. Uh, and therefore the Congress, uh, you know, to access the Congress and to excavate the Congress, we are, um, uh, we've recently applied for a permit from Navy History and Heritage Command. Um, and as Ed mentioned previously, the same would be the case if we were working on a Royal Naval vessel. We would have to apply for a permit from the British government for that kind of activity. 
but unfortunately those were not in <laughs> in place in the eight in the 19th century when they were happily pulling these things out kind of willy-nilly <laughs> or even into the middle of the 20th century when Hagland was recovering stuff yeah. And that's um, why making connections with a lot of like local folks who have some of these pieces is so important because, you know, we want to learn about them and be able to share this with folks. And they often, you know, are incredible storytellers like Bill Liege, uh, so knowledgeable. Uh, you know, the folks that are, have a lot of these private collections are, are extremely knowledgeable people. And so, you know, I think that's a, there's something to be said for that. I think it's a gray area in archaeology, but I also think that, you know, in terms of, knowing you, the community where you work and, uh, you know, people that have these things, like they care about these sites, like these are the stewards of these sites. And I think that's really po important point to bring across here. Um, and again, many voices, as many voices as you can pull into this story, um, it's just gonna help us understand more of what happened, so. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Makes, definitely makes for a much richer story. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we do have another question about uh, the Ferris home, um, asking if the Ferris home had a stone foundation. Um, has that material now found uh, fallen onto the beach or underwater? Uh, would it be worth a survey uh, in that area to gather more information about the homestead? That's a good question. Um, Chris and I have been still like, how much more, we can't really tell, I guess, like how much more has really eroded from that bank. I think that they did put, um, materials there to try to stop some of that erosion. Uh, yes, stone foundation. Um, a lot of those materials are, have fallen onto the beach. Um, there's still material there. I mean, it's an archeological site, um, but I don't know. I, I feel like they've done, a, they did a pretty thorough investigation of, of what was there. And then generally speaking, uh, you don't wanna dig up an entire archeological site. Um, that's just a common practice to leave bits there. Um, generally because technology improves over time. And, you know, if you completely wipe out a site, uh, then you've completely wiped out the site. So um, I don't know, Chris, you want to add to that? Uh, it's a good question. Um, there's certainly more research questions to be asked about it. Um, that True. site was rebuilt too, wasn't it? I mean, it was continued to be inhabited for many years after the events of, of 1776. Wasn't there a fire and the homestead was rebuilt? Quite possibly. <laughs> But you I know, to, I to back through, but, there is um, there is a lot of stuff that has a lot of the foundation stones that have fallen onto the shoreline. They are mostly still above water, unless it's a high water situation. And certainly, you know, at this point, there are stones. They're they're out of context, out of their original context. So there's only so much information that can be gained from them. Amongst that scatter, you do still see pieces of red brick uh, and other little odd you know, things that certainly suggest uh, that they may have been part of the homestead previously, but since they're not uh, in their, in context, in their proper locations, they, they have, you know, minor um, uh, research value at this point. We have certainly, we included that section or we will include that section of shoreline in our metal detecting survey. And we, we did uh, kind of re cover that area a little bit in our reconnaissance uh, that, that Joel mentioned um, and didn't find anything uh, historic related to that site. Yeah, and, that was mostly and modern. A couple of nails. So um, I think we have to rely on the, you know, pretty excellent documentation that David Starbuck and his team did back in 1989 for that information. Um, we have another one. If the uh, six pound shot has been conserved, um, any sign of a broad arrow? I see that. that um, nothing has been eye. conserved yet. Uh, this was all, all the photographs you saw are objects dirty from the field. Uh, we've only just finished cataloging and uh, I finally, you can actually see my photo set up behind me because I work from home now, but I just finally got everything uh, photographed. So we're going to start looking at the catalog now and um, start figuring out what's going to go in tanks first um, and and uh, what we'll do next. But there's actually a lot of clay, uh, compacted clay on that piece. So who knows? Maybe we will see that. I'm not sure. Um, we'll let you exciting. know, Mike. <laughs> yeah, we'll let you know. We'll keep you posted. <laughs> and the same is true. I see a question from uh, uh, from Joe Benning, from Senator Joe Benning about the Flint 
holder flint wrapper that he found that has not, yeah. also not been conserved yet but uh not yet. It's certainly a very diagnostic artifact and one we will um oh, be yeah. working on more closely really great time. find and uh yeah we'll keep you posted joe <laughs> for, for those of you who aren't may not be familiar with terminology on you know minor musket components a flint wrapper is actually it's a small lead folded piece of lead that was wrapped around the flint that was held in the jaws of a uh, flintlock musket so it, it, it was provided a cushion and additional grip to the jaws that held the flint that then would strike um, the frizzing and create the spark that fired a musket so definitely 18th century oh yeah just the kind of stuff that we're looking to find um talking about all this important work that's happened at arnold's bay um is there um any plan to protect the site of the study area that's a great mm, question that's a good um, question and th this is something uh, you know uh luckily the the majority of the terrestrial site is private uh, property so it is protected it is posted no trespassing it is actively enforced um, and we're thankful for that. The Hopper family who owns the property is very actively engaged in making sure that that site remains, uh, you know, protected. In water, um, it's, uh, it's, I think that, uh, I see that uh, that question is from Rich Eisenberg, who is a, a former Maritime Museum employee. Nice to see you, Rich, or to see, hear from you. Um, and I think his question relies more on is there protection for the Congress, and that's a that's a really interesting question and something that we are uh, have have been discussing somewhat. Um, is is that perhaps after if we have the opportunity to excavate the hall remains, that they are certainly backfilled uh, after excavation, and we may consider um, at least further enclosing the site in with uh, protecting it with sandbags. Um, or something along those nature. That's something that we will we'll, uh, pursue further with our colleagues from the Navy when we start discussing the project in more detail. Uh, it's in it's in quite shallow water though, Rich. So hopefully you're not anchoring in in that shallow of water anyway. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Uh, we do have. No, speaking again of the 3D models, um, we have a question: Will the 3D models of artifacts pre-conservation be made? It's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. Um, it's one. Well, Maybe. we have to. Like I said, we've just finished making the catalog, so we really have like, all very all fresh analysis to do. I gave you very preliminary. Like this is what we got. Um, but that's a, a great point to bring up, um, and uh, I think we'll make that call as we start, um, you know, shuffling through this material in a more uh, thoughtful way <laughs> than just what yeah. we've got. And to add to that as well, I think maybe some of the, um, maybe, you know, if we find larger, more significant pieces than possibly, we could certainly make one of this, the, the six pound cannonball, you know, models of each individual musket ball, probably not. They're just not that um, distinct. I know Joel gets all excited about musket balls, as we all do, but um, <laughs> they're, you know, visually they're, they're, it's not going to make a, a very compelling model. Um, what we have uh, models of on the Sketchfab site includes some of the tools. I, I see that uh, our good friend Taylor has put something in the um, in the chat section about the fact that the caulking iron, one of the caulking irons that was recovered from uh, the uh, remains of the Congress in the 1960s, has been modeled and is up on uh, on on Sketchfab thanks to uh, their tremendous efforts uh, last summer. And then so, uh, that's a 3D image of the ballast pile, yes. So we have some imagery yeah. of, was that? I think it was. It's, it, I do have it. I don't know if I've made it public yet, but that's something. Oh, that I, I thought made. it was in your presentation. Maybe I'm It sorry. was, <laughs> but I don't know that I've made the model uh, public on. on oh, OK, understood, understood. Um, and um, speaking of making things available to the public, we do have a question. Is the report from Dr. Starbuck's work um, available to the public? I think so. It certainly is. Now finding it is a whole nother question. Um, but if you are specifically interested in that, please reach out to me directly and I can uh, connect you with uh, a PDF copy of it. I 
think we have a PDF copy of it, right? I think we, we do as well. I saved it to the uh, shared file Dropbox that we have. Yeah, I, I'd be we'd be happy to share that with you. Um, Otherwise, I know the Vermont Archaeological Society Library has it. Like a lot of special collections libraries have it. Um, I'm pretty sure the UVM one does too. Um, yeah, but it's it's probably not something you're going to find at Barnes and Noble. So uh, no. just let us know when we can we can point you in the right direction. Yep. Excellent. Um, and as we wrap up, because I know we're starting to get close there on time, um, is there any evidence that the British um, put troops ashore at the bay? Not on October 13th. Um, but it does appear that they did later um, when they were doing some of the recovery efforts. Um, they do mention that when they returned to the bay, they found a number of uh, corpses floating uh, in the shallow water of Arnold's Bay and that they buried those uh, bodies ashore. And then we have some evidence of um, uh, British forces moving through the area later in the Revolutionary War during Brown, the next year, right? during the Burgoyne campaign the next year in 76, yeah. they actually unloaded the, the load of horses onto the Ferris property and it ruined the Ferris property. Right. They apparently I think uh, that's wasn't that when the fire happened? Am I making this up? Quite possible. Oh, I think I think the, I think the house was raised by the British later on. Okay. Probably, oh, okay. Remember right, it was in it was towards the you know the end of the revolution, probably. Oh, okay. Nine or so, yeah, they destroyed the house. Um, but uh, yeah, there was a lot of British involvement there um, after the fact. Right. We and we have. I think I mentioned that they, the Americans, did establish a, a temporary line of defense there in case the British attempted to put folks ashore. But I, th that yeah. didn't happen on October thirteenth itself. Right. I think that's yeah. right. Excellent. Um, and uh, I heard there was interest in raising the Spitfire. Is this true and best left preserved in place? Um, that is an option that has been discussed in the past for the Spitfire. Our current thinking is that um, it probably is best if it's left in place, both for the vessel um, and we can achieve um, our archaeological goals of uh, understanding the vessel and its crew to the fullest extent um, by excavating the, the, the vessel in place and documenting it thoroughly um, and therefore avoiding the, you know, tremendous costs of conserving uh, a vessel in perpetuity uh, and finding a display space for it. Um, so that's the current thinking and the plan that we're moving forward with uh, currently. Excellent. All right, so I think we've we've been able to hit most of our questions here. Um, Are we able to save all of the questions that have come in? Because I would love to just try and field stuff that we didn't get to, um, or give it a shot anyway. I don't know if you can save those or save the chat or save the Q&A or whatever, but. I, I think we have the ability to do that. So yeah, we can always see if we can follow up with folks afterwards. Yeah. And, and I, I realized that we didn't uh, address every question. I'm sorry about that. We don't have time yeah. to answer everything, but uh, if you too have, many good ones. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of great questions. Feel free to reach out to us directly if you have additional questions. Um, and yeah, maybe we'd be that's happy a better to answer way. for you. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Well, we just we definitely want to say thanks on behalf of the museum again to all of our fantastic presenters today Chris Sabic, um, Cher Gilligan. Joel, Ed, and, um, and Nathan, uh, thank you all so much for being able to be here today to take part in this. Um, we're so glad we were able to do this and hopefully this is something we can do uh, again in the future. And um, it's just been, we're so glad we were able to have such an enthusiastic response um, from the community on this topic. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks everyone. Thank all right, you, thank everyone. you all so much. Are we doing a closing?